it has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. pioneering chef who started a slow food mm -hmm. movement. Yeah, Harry Smith got to spend some time with Alice Waters in her in her natural habitat. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. You know, typically we go to do a story, right? Yeah. We rush in, yeah. the guy set up, we get going, and then we're going to do yeah. the interview, and then we rush <laughs> out again. We got to Alice Waters. She said, whoa, 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 whoa. Take a look at this, right? She said, set up, then eat. Ooh, Just what? Have, oh. Right, she oh, made us oh, these oh, pizzas. Wow. There's salad from the garden. Before the interview. Look at this. Before the interview. Hey, it's she's it's called buttering you up, message. Harry. <laughs> <laughs> it's really more, it's a metaphor and a message. Slow down. A Meyer lemon tree. I Rizzes. see it right there. <laughs> Alice Waters' backyard is small, welcoming, wonderful. I have a cherry tree, which doesn't have very many cherries. But I have quince tree. Love a quince. A few feet away, a giant redwood stands sentinel. When studying abroad in France at the age of 19, the woman who would become the prophetess of the slow food movement had an epiphany. And I would eat in little small restaurants and they're run by a family. And it was a revelation to me. Her revelation turned into one of America's most renowned restaurants, Chez Panisse. For 50 years, the mothership of locally sourced, organic, seasonal cooking. Five decades of learning and seeking, resulting in We Are What We Eat, a slow food manifesto. Why did you call it a manifesto? I wanted to convince people of my theory. I wanted it to be in that place of understand this. Please, listen, I feel that we in this country and around the world have been sensorily deprived because of a fast food culture indoctrination. The bombardment of ads, the boulevards of burgers. Convenience has a shortcut, she says, is short-sighted. We don't know the true cost of the cheap food we eat. Mm. We don't know what the cost is to the environment or to our health. Food mass produced for mass consumption. The way the industrial food system is organized is shocking. Fast, in fact, makes her furious. It's convenient to buy food to go. But when you cook it yourself and you offer it to a friend, you get something else that is invaluable. And don't we all wish we had the time to do that? Elitist, cry her critics. Is it elitist to want to support 
the people who take care of the land and their farm workers. The trade-off to convenience, she contends, has come at considerable personal cost, obesity, diabetes, and more. An answer to start, kids, her edible schoolyard project. Students cultivate a garden, then cook what's in it. It's been adopted in almost 10,000 schools. If these teenage kids, if they grow it in the garden and they cook it in the kitchen classroom, they all eat it. The manifesto reads like a life guide, the world according to Alice. We're trying to educate the senses and food is the best way to do it. It touches all those senses. And so it opens your mind. And once your mind is opened in that way, you can see the beauty. You can taste. Savoring food, she believes, leads to savoring life. Leaving convenience behind, liberating. I've had 50 years at Chez Panisse, and I've been feeding people these ideas for 50 years. And I guess they've been liking it because they keep coming back. Oof. It's oh, seductive, oh, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Right? Good yes, work. it is. <laughs> Harry's got a little food crush. Harry yeah. was like, tell me more. More pizza. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's cool. What's so, so cool things in the, what, some of the writing is mm -hmm. just so beautiful. One of the things she says, I think that in this way, speed feels feeds our sense of loneliness. Mm. We send a text and expect an instantaneous response. Mm -hmm. Lying on a couch and daydreaming is considered wasteful, transgressive almost. Wow. wow. Take, I could oh, just sit in this very You're right. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful power. Again, Alice Waters' book, it's called We Are What We Eat. It is out right now, and you can find out more on today.com slash shop. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. to that ins really inspirational story of Sam Schmidt. Sam Schmidt is an Indy car driver who was paralyzed from the shoulders down 21 years ago. Yeah, Harry Smith has followed him as he's learned to do incredible things, driving again and going skydiving. And Sam's latest chapter is the most emotional yet. Mm. Harry's on assignment this morning at the Barber Motorsports Museum in Birmingham, Alabama. Hi, Harry. Good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. And if, to get inspired for uh, the race on Sunday, the big Indy 500 race, there's no better place than this, this Barber Vintage Motorsports Museum. But if, if you're looking for inspiration, we've got a guy we want you to meet if you haven't met him before on, on the Today Show, a friend of ours who was going to be trackside at Indy, and he inspires us every day. It's a practice day at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Aero McLaren team owner Sam Schmidt is standing trackside. We said standing. Sam Schmidt is a quadriplegic. When you were in that bed 20 some years ago, flat on your back in Florida, did you think this was possible? Not even close. Yeah, we didn't know if I'd make it the first week, let alone the first month. 
Schmidt was then an IndyCar driver. A crash in Orlando left him paralyzed from the shoulders down. Everybody thought it was insane that why would I go back to a sport that put me in a wheelchair? I've been racing since I was five years old. It's all I ever want to do is compete at this place. And that to me is what's kept me alive for 21 years. We first met Sam five years ago, and truth be told, we had our doubts. Could a man in his condition actually drive? Yup. Three years later, he brought his much improved high-tech car to New York. We rode with him through Manhattan traffic from Harlem to Rockefeller Center. He has since raced up Pikes Peak and competed in an amateur race. What if, wondered the people at Aero Electronics, they could get Sam walking? When they presented you with the idea of let's try to do this, what did you say? Where do I sign up? Where do I go? What do you want me to do? We watched as Sam's team got him set up in an exoskeleton. This is 1.0, clearly. Their goal with it is that I, I won't need to be balanced and that I will be able to operate it completely myself, which is a mega task. Imagine walking without assistance. Sam does. Do you dream about it? You know, that's the funny thing, Harry. In 21 years, I've never had a dream where I was in a wheelchair. Wow. I'm always, sorry. I'm always walking around, you know, with my kids and the race team and everything else. That morning, Sam's racing team saw something they had never seen before. Yeah. Their boss, not in a wheelchair. What is it like for you to be standing up? I've almost ran out of words to describe the feeling in this entire process. Um, epic, mega, unbelievable. Oh, After 21 cool. years, I didn't remember what the view was like. The view. The view. <laughs> I haven't gotten a full body hug in 21 years. And, uh, and we got some of those today. There were tears when Tim Bauman saw Sam that day. That's pretty wild. Bauman was part of the crew that pulled Sam from the wreckage 21 years ago. Seems to me you were having a little trouble holding it together when you saw Sam walk up. <laughs> that's that's uh, not something we, you know, in, and I've been a paramedic for 38 years. And we have people with, with the prognosis. Yeah, we don't see this. I mean, and to see it, it just, it's, it's inspirational as hell. Pushing limits seems to be in Sam's DNA. The word can't is not in his vocabulary. Like building the Driven Neuro Recovery Center in Las Vegas and leading the Conquer Paralysis Now Foundation. Do you feel like maybe there's a part of you that feels like maybe you were chosen? Like you're the guy who can rise above this? Absolutely. Way, way, way more important than anything I could have done as a professional race car driver. Standing up, getting out of the wheelchair, it's been a big spring for Sam. I saw you coming onto this cart, and I kept looking at your empty wheelchair. What's it like for you to leave that behind? It's amazing, and I think I'm ready to hang a four sale sign on it. <laughs> but most important of all was this moment. Yes! When he danced with his daughter at her wedding. I'm surprised to have any tears left. You know, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a wild month. And the wild spring continues for Sam. I'll tell you, I know, get the Kleenex out. It's just too much. Uh, he has three cars and three drivers on his team. All three qualified for the Indy race on Sunday. Wow. So, yeah, right. And as I say. And as he says, this, this gizmo that he's working with now, it's 1.0, sort of what the car was mm -hmm. like five or six or seven years ago. Who knows what it might turn into two or three or four or five years in our future. Mm -hmm. Just amazing. Trailblazer. Wow. So you're just all, you're speechless here. On so many speechless. levels. To dance speechless. with his daughter yeah. at her wedding. Right? Incredible. Mm -hmm. Harry. Yeah. Harry, yeah. we love you. We've got a great show for you on this Thursday morning, including an all-day exclusive chat you can only see here. Plus, Savannah, Hoda, Craig, and I'll get a taste of Tokyo and enjoy a traditional Japanese lunch. 
but let's kick it off with Talking Tokyo. No fans are allowed at the stands at the Olympic events, but without the sounds of applause, another noise has become the soundtrack to the Olympic Games. Take a listen. It is time for Talking Tokyo. Uh, yes. It's become my favorite segment. Here. Me too. It's the one we're least prepared for. You may have noticed that without the sounds of applause from fans in the stands, there's a different sound cheering on the athletes here. Take a listen. Off the cup just yet. Chance for Roy to just unleash one here. This reachable par five. Did you hear a little hum? Yeah, oh, I, when I was watching today, yeah, that's, they were a lot louder than that. Okay, well, cicadas. Yes, the cicadas are here. They've become the soundtrack of these games at some of the biggest competitions outside in and around the Olympic venues. In fact, the one inch long insects are known as the sound of summer here in Japan. Hmm. What do you think? Wow. Better or worse than silence for the athletes? Uh, it, I think worse. Yeah. Because it sounds like there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. The cicada, the sound of the cicada is so annoying. Mm, it is. You know, um, j we have, I think we have video just a moment ago when we were doing an interview with Stephanie mm -hmm. Gosk here on set. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are these giant green bugs. I don't think they're the cicadas, but look at this. It landed right on Craig, <laughs> quick reflexes. He flicked it. <laughs> he flicked it right actually onto our cameraman. But look how steady the shot is. He didn't even flinch. Well, and you, you and, and Stephanie too, unflappable. Like you, you both were right there. No, it was amazing. But we, they, in addition to the cicadas, those big green bugs are That's everywhere. Right. My chief concern was flicking it on you. You I didn't want, flick I it. I wanted to make sure I got it away. You protected from, me. You took out our camera guy. But what the heck? We no. got five. Well, on his birthday so, too. Happy John. birthday, John. Sorry, John. There you go. Sorry. Happy birthday to you. Here's something that's been catching our eye on the streets of uh, Tokyo: vending machines. Tokyo is famous for the endless number of things you can buy in them around here, toys, clothes, office supplies, all up for grabs at the touch of a button in these one-stop shops. For those wishing to take home a little piece of the game, souvenir vending machines, the latest hit, all types of our Olympic memorabilia from mugs, hats, wow. to our little friends, our little mascots, Miritoa and Somete, they're in these things as well. Uh, so you guys checked out the vending machines? I, I love the vending machines. They, have, they put everything, everything in there. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. It's cool, they're really everything. coins too. Welcome back to Tokyo. So yesterday we got to see this beautiful city, albeit by, by bus. Uh, today we finally got to enjoy a taste of Tokyo. We sure did. Invited by the Sakura restaurant at the Hilton Odeba Hotel for a traditional Japanese lunch. Yes, yeah, Sakura is Japanese for cherry blossom, and this was truly one of the cherries on top of an already amazing trip. Tokyo has an incredible culinary culture in which we were happily about to partake. Here we are. This is a traditional Japanese restaurant. Why are you whispering? Well, because, are we in a library? Well, because you know, they, don't, they don't talk loudly at these restaurants. It's, oh, it's kind of like food version of a golf tournament. What's the name of the restaurant? Sakura. 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 Al, will you show us where we're going? Please. Is it this way? This way. Thank you, Al. Shades right over this way. Oh, this is lovely. Uh -huh. What is this? Nice. It, oh, somebody what? went to charm wow. school. Wow. There you go. Is that Thank the sweetest thing for you, Al? Our chairs were pulled oh, in, girl. hands wiped clean, napkins folded <laughs> elegantly in our laps. Oh. Oh, oh my beautiful. goodness. Beautiful. That is gorgeous. <gasps> That's too pretty to eat. I know. Some presentation in preparation for kaiseki, a traditional Japanese multi-course meal. Very simple uh, cooking and food that tastes fresh. And, and head chef Imoto-san explained today it was yes. all about the small bites. But to us, it looked like we were about to bite into a work of art. Our first course of small plates included mashed turnip soup. So you stir it up and then just get in there. Really good, the soup. You got it. It's almost like a, it's like a custard. Yes, it is. Hold beef. Where's the beef? Right here, Al. You love beef. You're going to want a big bowl of this one. Sashimi. Oh. And tempura. Mm. 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 Very good. Oh, you tried the tempura? tempura is crazy. And there was only one thing that could top Jeff, this tempura. Craig, would you really like some sake? As far as I can tell, you guys are pretty much living on sake here. We are. We are. We thoroughly enjoy the sake. It's uh oh. Uh -huh. oh, oh boy. Now we're talking. Now it's a party. Yeah. Yes. I love these. Which is the biggest one? <laughs> well, Hoda, you pioneered daytime drinking, so maybe you should do the toast. This is a, this is an honor for me. First of all, it's great to share a meal with you. It's even better to share a sake with you. How do you say it again? 
乾杯。乾杯。乾杯。乾杯。I might come by here again. <laughs> Such delectable delights deserved a round of applause, but our feast for the eyes was not over. Oh, <gasps> oh. oh. Layers. Wow. Layers. Wow. Layers. wow. Okay, that's beautiful. It's like a food version of a nesting doll. A double layered bento box revealed sushi. How do I get into this politely? Mmm, that's the one. Seasonal vegetables and fruit. Oh, you put the, put the scallions in the, here, like that. And a real crowd pleaser for this crew: soba noodles. What's your technique? Just like this. I'll show you. Oh my God! Hold it up high. Come on, let's see it. Al, look at it. Oh, that's how you do it. Oh, my gosh. oh that looks much easier. Oh. Al's a classy guy. I know. I need a bib. How do you say delicious? Oishi. Oishi. But we weren't quite done. After all, this wasn't just a meal. It was an experience. This is very cool. I've wanted to try this. Closing with the traditional tea ceremony is said to promote peace, harmony, and happiness. Mission accomplished. Okay. One, two, seven. And then when and you're and done, and turn, you wipe it. Right. One, <laughs> two, all done. done. Arigato. 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 That was a lot of fun. It was. It was fun. Yeah, and the, the one part our producer Jen Long cut out was when you and I did that lady in the tramp moment. <laughs> With, with the, the silver noodles. noodles? Yeah. 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 I'm special. glad she left that out. Very special. It was, it was, you guys have really bonded here. Yeah. Uh, There's been a lot of sake between you. That's what's, that's what's led to the bonding. It really was. I mean, the presentation is so beautiful. Yeah. It's like a piece of art that you get to eat. Almost too pretty to eat. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you to the, uh, to the hotel here for having us. Up next on Today Talks, four of Team USA's newest medal winners join us on the third hour. Stay with us. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now, it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Welcome back. Today on the third hour, we have Team USA's newest Olympic medal winners, including the equestrian team who brought home a silver, the U.S.'s best showing in 73 years. Take a look. And this morning, we're joined by some of Team USA's newest Olympic medal winners. Teammates Adrian Lynn, Alayo, I'm sorry, Stefan Peters, and Sabine Chutkari bringing home silver in the equestrian dressage team Grand Prix Special. That's the United States' best showing in 73 years. The drought is over, uh, but that's <laughs> not all. Team USA also took home the silver medal in women's trap shooting thanks to Kaylee Browning, and we have all of them with us this morning. Congratulations. So Thank you. Just incredible wins. So Adrian, Stefan, and uh, Sabine, we want to start with you guys. Uh, first silver, me silver medal in 73 years. How does this feel? Well, it's, for me, it's my fifth Olympics. I've been doing this since uh, 1996. And just to give you an idea, you know, we were um, sitting while Sabine was doing her performance. Um, Adrian was sitting below me. I had my hand on her shoulder and every single minute we're getting closer to a bronze medal. 
Now, halfway through the test, it's getting closer and closer to the silver medal. The British rider went in, and I still get so emotional about this when I think about that situation. I was holding her, her shoulder, we both jumped up, and we knew we had that silver medal. It was an incredible feeling, one of the best memories of my life. Sabine, I can only imagine. What was going through your mind? Um, well, I was going last and Stefan and Adrian put in a really solid, great test and the wait was long and um, all I was thinking is don't mess up. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Yes, and then I had to make sure my horse doesn't feel it, so I had to fool him. <laughs> and, you know, look, and we talk about this and you guys are these terrific athletes, Adrian, but you, you depend on this other yeah. entity, this other being, how, how, what is that connection like? It truly is a partnership. I mean, we live and breathe these animals. We've trained them for years to get here and they they have to trust you when you go in. We fly them halfway around the world and go in these strange venues and they put their total faith in us and, you know, focus and let us control every single footfall. We had uh, every performance on our team with no mistakes, which was an incredible accomplishment to sneak into that silver medal position. And our animals, we do it because we love them. We do it with a passion for the horses. Kaylee, let's turn to you for a moment because you, you took home the, the silver medal and the trap shooting event um, losing out on, on the goal by just one hit as I understand it nonetheless it's silver medal uh, something to be very proud of what what was going through your mind as, as you stood there on the medal stand um, you know this is the pinnacle of my career this far and it's something that I've chased for a really long time I mean I'm 29 years old but I have a 20 year career um, so it's it's been a long time coming so it was just a very surreal moment how does one get into trap shooting at nine just out of curiosity <laughs> well I'm from Arkansas so <laughs> there's not much to do other than you know shoot and hunt but my dad shot competitively so he was a national champion yeah he he was He's, what did, what advice did he give you um, you know, he's always told me never give up until the last shot's over. You know, there's always, always a fight. You never know what the other competitor is going to do. You can only control yourself. So just keep going till that last, that last shot. And that paid off because um, today I had to run. I couldn't miss on my last round to get into the finals, and I had to do that, and I was able to do it. So. Well, you made uh, Dad proud. You made Arkansas proud. You made Team USA proud. So congratulations to all of you. Congrats. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks for being here. Thank really, you. Thank really you. Really appreciate it. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, Hoda is at the Gymnastics Center and brings us the latest from the women's individual all-around final. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything for traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Welcome back. Today on Hoda and Jenna, the latest Olympic moments, including Caleb Dressel's new Olympic record, his emotional win, and his family's sweet reaction. Take a look. 
another big um, event that everybody's talking about, swimming. Yes. This was a big one. It was another big day for USA Swimming. Caleb Dressel. Who we love. Right? You what? and I both kind of have a crush on him. And his, and his wife. His wife. We have a girl crush on yes. his wife. She's beautiful. Well, he won his first yeah. individual gold. He took gold in the 100-meter freestyle. And guess what? He set a new Olympic record in the process, finishing the race in 47.02 seconds. Look at that smile and, you know, and the just genuine emotion, those muscles. Uh, his family's <laughs> reaction That's his uh, wife. was everything. His mom, Christina, she could barely watch. She was so nervous. His wife, Megan, as Jen and I were just talking about, she's so beautiful. She was completely overcome. Okay. Um, and Caleb, Caleb, this is what got me. He was is, so, he was emotional after the race. Yeah. And when he saw them, after this, during this was during the post-race interview. Uh, and then on the medal stand, I mean, it was just such a moment. How beautiful was yeah. that? I loved it when he was talking to his family. I wish we had more of that. Can we just go back and look at that moment for one more <laughs> second? Because one, it's just so sweet to see the fact that his family, who, you know, he was the little boy that learned how to swim at some point. His mm -hmm. mom and dad see him as that little boy, but also that they can't be there. I know. I feel like that is a huge difference. And like when they got to first look talk. At that. Oh, it gives me chills. I mean, so look at good. his wife and he. I mean, the, first of all, they're the most, most beautiful, beautiful couple ever. Yeah. Okay, there was another amazing moment in the pool. Mm -hmm. This was incredible. Oh, yes, yes. Olympian Bobby Fink uh -huh. in the 800 meter free. So explain why this was so amazing. Okay, because he was in fourth or maybe yeah. fifth. It's hard to see. It was right down to the line for most of the race. But take a look at the finish. Bobby Fink's up there in lane three, making his own move. And the American is passing by everybody. Unbelievable. Fink is going to win gold for the United States in the first ever 800 free in the Olympics. Wow. I mean... You know, I heard, uh, heard Savannah say a little early this morning, the announcers weren't even talking about him at first. You know, it was like he was kind of off the radar and then just like the little engine that could. I mean, that's also determination like we can't even understand. Like something out of a story. And grit. How awesome is that? Okay, yeah. so speaking of amazing athletes, we're getting our first look at something that we cannot stop talking about this morning. It is a new movie about the early years of Venus and Serena Williams. It's called King Richard, and it focuses on their ambitious father. Here's the thing. This isn't just any old documentary. Will Smith yes. is playing their father. They're endorsing it. Serena just posted about it this morning. Right. Look at this. The chances of achieving the kind of success that you're talking about is just very, very unlikely. Okay, you're making a mistake, but I'm gonna let you make it. Watch me hit a few balls. All right. So tell me your names again. I'm Venus. I'm Serena. So what do you think? I wrote me a 78-page plan for their whole career before they was even born. Yeah, baby, yeah! <laughs> These girls are so great, how come I've never heard of them? They're from Compton. It's okay. They're just not used to seeing good-looking peoples like us. She's nervous. Take a step up. Maybe she ought to take a few more steps up. Just get someplace safe. I think you might just have the next Michael Jordan. Oh, no, brother man. I got me the next, too. Tears in my eyes. I can't wait. Not wait to see that. I can't wait. So Serena posted it. Uh, Will Smith shared the trailer on Instagram. He he wrote, "One of the greatest honors as an actor is to be able to celebrate someone's legacy yes. while they're still here." creating it. King Richard hits theaters uh, and HBO Max on November 19th. I know what that I'm doing on Thanksgiving, just, right? Oh my gosh. You know those Thanksgiving films that you can't wait to see? Listen. We are back on this Thursday here in Studio 1A. Chanel is hanging out with me while Hoda's in Tokyo at the Gymnastics Center where it's been a crazy eventful evening there. Hi, Hoda. Girl, I it cannot be believe surreal. what happened here. Like, yeah. I'm in shock. I am, like, sitting here in shock. I mean, Suni Lee, 18-year-old, first-time Olympian, comes here on the world's biggest stage. Uh, pressure, I can't even imagine what she was going through. She has to go through all the different disciplines. She's got to do the bars and the beam and the floor and the vault, all of it. She's cool as a cucumber. It's like a nail biter. We're looking at the numbers. We're literally with calculators going, oh my gosh, how much more? Can she make it? Can she win? It was nutso. And finally at the end, she gets the gold. Oh. I ran downstairs to interview her in like the mix zone. Yeah. She had her mask on. She was crying. She was amazing. And she was holding her medal. And she said, um, I said to my dad, this is our dream. So Aww. she goes, this has never been my dream. It's been our 
our dream. She goes, so this is for my dad and my mom and my coach, because my coach doesn't get a medal, <sighs> so he deserves this too. She stood there holding that medal, talking about everyone else who deserved it. <sighs> this is an 18-year-old whose dad built her a beam in their backyard. <sighs> They didn't have the funds and the money to do all this, you know, fancy stuff. He built her a beam in the backyard, oh, and she said the cry. only regret she had was that he wasn't wasn't here, you know, in the stadium with her um, for obvious reasons. But oh, anyway, Hoda. it was nuts, you guys. Hoda. It was such a moment. I know. I'm dying I mean, here. It's the sweetest. And is it true? Tom Yamas told us earlier that she was holding up hearts to you as she was competing. <laughs> I know. Is that true? You know what's so funny? I don't know if you can, yeah, you know, I don't know if you, well, you can't really see, but that's where the beam was yeah. right behind oh, wow. me. Right yeah. So I, she's like walking oh right where that guy in the red is, yeah. like she's walking down there. So I looked up at her and she held up a heart and Aww. then, and then I held up a heart and then, and then I started like feeling like it was my kid, oh, even though yeah. she's not <laughs> clearly. So I started to like, I was feel like I was going to start crying and she looked at me and she goes, don't cry. I was Aww. like, Oh my God, she's on the Olympic oh, stage. Well, she, I'm a basket case. She got the Calm gold? down. All while she's competing. That was before. No, she's she was about amazing. to do the beam. Well, you look at me and, then she's, and give me and heart she was, moves so that maybe she's one amazing. Day. That's <laughs> awesome. The love in that room. That's the thing. It but may not be a lot of people in there, imagine? but there's a lot of love in there. You know, by the way, we have a little video. Oh, there we is, should look and at let this. me tell you, when they... Yeah. We, we have this what? video, Hoda. I don't know if okay. you've seen it, of Suni's family watch party. Have you seen this? They say they've, that she gets to accomplish what she calls our dream. Here we go. Here it is. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. How great is oh that? Oh, my gosh. Oh, There's her dad, dad and her mom. Yes. Oh, jeez. Oh, uh, and her sister. Oh, my gosh. How did the room and by react the way, when you found out? The Hmong out? community. Oh my God! Well, first of all, Jade. This was kind of weird because after we knew she got the gold, Jade still had to compete on the floor. And by the way, tied for the highest, uh, the highest rating on the floor. Oh, Jade awesome. did. She was amazing. And she said before she went on, she said they were looking at the numbers. She said, "I knew that Suni won," and I started crying. And this is before she had to finish up her rotation. So, and by the way, Simone was in the audience. Michaela was in the audience. Jordan was in the audience and they were screaming and you know it was just it was beautiful when the anthem played like I wanted to like melt into a puddle <laughs> she was looking up at that flag and it was the most beautiful thing in the world and I thought man talk about like a dream come true like th that was it in real time it was pretty incredible she's a she's a great kid I'm mm. so happy you were there to watch it and to cheer her on because I'm sure she oh. wished her parents were there but the, but you're like a stepmother yeah, she was, she was happy you representative. were there yeah oh, that is <laughs> So that sweet, awesome. the day. nice kind of stepmother. Hoda, okay. many, Hoda, you <laughs> just tell me how many chips did you eat? Be honest. I'm, I, you know what? I need to purge. Okay, it's just been a lot. It's been a lot. I need to. Are there hit wrappers? The I'm pretty sure stop. I know what the floor looks. Wrappers all There's around you. <laughs> I know. Well, I cleaned up because I, I don't want to be gross. But, <laughs> but literally, oh no, poor Kylie who works with us. Kylie is like, she came equipped with like a hefty bag full of snacks. Please just it's show. It's kind of getting gross. Greeny, Matt, Matt Greenfield's here. He Hi, was Maddie. like, please stop eating. He literally said it out loud. Here's Matt. Did you, did you not say please stop uh, eating? I, I mean, I was concerned. I was a little concerned. <laughs> I know. See, he said he was worried. I know. You <laughs> just don't want to get you don't was getting out of control. and get sick before the gold medal it's was awarded. Know. You know? You got to be so careful. Funny. Okay. We love you. <laughs> You're an awesome bonus, Mom. You're the best. Goodbye. Go Bye. home, get Bye. some sleep, Bye. and we'll see you tomorrow. Today, Talks continues after the break with my exclusive chat with Chanel. You can only see here on Today All Day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it.
And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Welcome back to Today Talks and our exclusive content you can only see here on Today All Day. Hey. Hi. Hey. How are Do you? Do you like this? You just sit in the chair and you have no idea what's coming? It's my new favorite thing. Is I'm going to miss this so much next <laughs> week, and I'm sure you will, too. I will. I love it. No, and I'm joking. I, I do love it. You are going to miss it a little, right? A hundred percent. Like, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, what are we going to talk about? And what we do is it's the first thing that comes to mind. So for me, we have, you know, now that COVID slowly but surely we're getting a little better. Yeah. One of our friends in the Today Show kitchen is here. Yes. Right? And so anytime we have props on the show, before when COVID was happening, it all be cold. Or we they, wouldn't really get they food. They tell us in our ear, don't eat it, yeah. or, you know, whatever. But this morning, we had these Brussels sprouts and cauliflower and pepperoni pizza, everything dip, drizzled with hot honey. Can I just say, though, um, you, the, you're starting with Brussels sprouts, yes. but do you remember what happened to me in the 9 o'clock? Oh, the Cheetos. Yeah, I'll post this picture. <laughs> Can't with, eat just one. No, no. Unfortunately, I really couldn't eat just seven. <laughs> I had a Cheeto attack. I hadn't had breakfast, and I just ate 12 Cheetos, oh, yeah. and I feel like, it, like I sort of did like what would Hoda do. But here's my thing. This is why all the women here get along. Like, very rarely are we, you know, unless we're all, like, trying to reel it in that one day. But for the most part, we're not the folks who just don't no. eat. No. Like, we actually genuinely eat. I know. <laughs> well, fault, yes, but. that's an issue. Yeah. But it, it's hilarious that you said the Brussels with hot honey. I can't. So, my, I brought it up because right now, all I'm thinking about is trying to go home the next and recreate meal. this whatever with hot honey. I'd never had hot honey You know before. what it's good on? And this what? is, people might judge me for this. And I'm, I'm okay. I'm open for judgment. It's good on cottage cheese. What? No, that, you know what? It is on a little toast or a rice cake. Actually, you know what? What did you put on the toast earlier today? Ricotta. He had ricotta, so then I guess you're right. Y'all, this all that. stems from a 9 o'clock segment, by the way, where we had Chassis Post mm -hmm. talking about these delicious things that you can buy online. Mm -hmm. Mike's Hot Honey is something Henry and I eat all the time. So you've had it. I, I ate it with cauliflower last night because, frankly, it makes cauliflower good. Wow. What do you, how do you do the cauliflower? Like I air just, fryer? Yeah, just an air fryer, just normal cauliflower. I did a little lentils, and I just dipped everything Ooh, in hot honey. You're quite the gourmet. That sounds amazing. Well, I mean, frozen cauliflower from the Whole Foods, you oh, know. But I thought maybe you were, like, chopping it and making some lentils. Oh. That sounds amazing. Well, I had, didn't make lentils. But, no, I mean, gourmet-ish. But Ish. my point is... Okay. Hot honey on anything is I'm delicious. I feel like just yesterday we were talking about something else that was good. I don't even remember. But I feel like every time you watch this today, we're talking day, about eating. Yeah. That's probably I'm true. I'm going to work on that. That's probably true. Is there true. anything else to talk about? Well, I mean, yes, gymnastics. That is true. How much fun was it to see Hoda yeah. living really her best life? I mean, I know she was so excited to be there. And we got that little tidbit that Suni, right before Suni she. Suni Lee, yeah. Yeah, before she won the gold. I, I know, I think of her as my friend. I'm like, Suni, right before she got the gold. Gold was doing a little heart to Hoda. to Hoda. You know what I think? Because the girls don't have their family members there, you know, Hoda's like the, the family substitute. You know yes. what I mean? She's like the fill-in. And so, and she gives such love. So I think she's almost reassuring. They hear her yelling. So it's been really mad. I called her a stepmom, and she was like, but I'm the nice stepmom, and then you had a bonus mom. I called mom. her the bonus mom. That's right. The bonus yeah. mom is the better way. Isn't that great, it, though? It, it was so awesome, and yeah. I think it probably made Hoda's day, too. And it's a year unlike any other. You know what's so interesting? Hoda always says her mom was like, is and was as a child such a cheerleader, that her mom would be on the side just cheering and Hoda is that way, as we mm. both know, as a friend. Mm -hmm. So to see her get to be that on the world stage. For these Olympians. I mean, that's my Olympic highlight. Yeah. And it's not even over yet. That's a morning boost. We should just do that tomorrow. Hoda should be the morning boost. For tomorrow. The heart, the whole thing. Okay. Maybe we'll see what happens. Yeah. My, I mean, we're not producers, but let's go for <laughs> we it. make some phone calls. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of Today Talks. Keep watching. For I'm going to go get some hot honey. Today, all day. We're going to eat. Okay. Goodbye. Wait. Don't leave me. Where's the Cheetos? Twenty-four years old, and you're wow! I just noticed the uh, the tat. Is that a new one? 
this was all, it's five years old. Give us the story on the Olympic rings, if you don't mind. So first team was in 2016. It's a little 19 year old uh, buckaroo uh, made the team. And that was really the talk of camp. So once you make the team, you get shipped off to camp. That's what everyone talks about is where you're going to get your ring tattoo. So decided on the forearm. As soon as I got back from Rio, uh, went to the tattoo shop, which actually the same guy, same artist who did my uh, tattoo over here. Yeah. And then um, I wanted them on their own and I wanted them matched up with a flag. So I got everything incorporated that I wanted. So when you win, um, when you win a half dozen or so golds this summer, wh where are those tats going? Oh, I'm not getting any, I'm done. You're I'm, done. I'm done for a bit, yeah. So let's talk about swimming just in general. How did Caleb Dressel get into swimming? I ask myself that question a lot, actually. You know, some days more than others when I'm not doing too good in the pool here, I ask myself that a lot. Um, I think the sport chose me. I did a lot of sports growing up, track, basketball, only on the weekends. I was a weekend warrior with a lot of things, uh, soccer, football. I wanted to be a receiver in the NFL, actually. That was my that was my first dream as a kid, yep. So I was pretty quick on land, I had good hand-eye coordination. Um, I couldn't walk away from the sport. Around age 12, I was doing uh, football and swimming. Couldn't step away from the sport. So I think the sport chose me. I love the challenges that it throws my way. I love, you know, learning a lot about myself. The water teaches me a lot about myself, a little more than I would like sometimes, yeah. um, but sport chose me. What's it teach you about yourself? There's a lot of valleys with the sport and a lot of mountaintops. Um, you know, it can take you to some places where you're really uncomfortable uh, and it'll take you to some training points mentally. And you got to find out quickly who you are, what you're really made of and move on from it. And I'm really appreciative of those moments. And that's why I'm still doing this sport. And I think still enjoying it is the challenges that it brings to make me a better person, better swimmer, better athlete, everything incorporated into being a person, being a man. Uh, the water, I think, is has contributed a lot to that. You've said in the past that swimming is it's just just getting from point A to point B. That would seem to be a, a, a bit oversimplified. No. I think simple is good. You know, that's that's the premise of the sport. How high can your hips stay in the water? How fast can you get from there to there? That's why I enjoy swimming. It's very simple, very primitive. Let me see if I can go faster than you. Um, There's no judging, no scores, just time. Let me get my hand on the wall faster than you. You've talked about every day engaging in some simple tasks, just picking up trash, writing in a journal. What is it about those simple tasks that help you in the pool? I think greatness is found within mundanity, you know, those boring little ticks throughout the day. I call it putting pennies in the bank. Uh, my coach calls it putting tools in the toolbox. I think that's where greatness is found. You know, if people want to dream up this big giant goal without putting the stepping stones along the way. And for me, that's what gets you to that giant goal. Um, you have to be able to do the boring tasks, the tasks that no one seems to care about except yourself, making your bed, picking up trash, streamlining off the walls, um, how many kicks am I taking off the wall? They're all relatively simple things. The hard part is doing them consistently and over and over and over again. That's why I like saying pennies in the bank. Yeah. You drop a penny in the bank every day, you're going to have a lot of money, maybe over a long period of time, but eventually you're going to have a good amount of money in there and you're going to have a pretty big investment. I've seen results from putting pennies in the bank. That's something the water has showed me. That's something my coaches showed me, my teammates. And that's what journaling helps with. I journal as well. What do you want the 44-year-old Caleb Dressel to read about 20 years from now in, in these journals? I have two different types of journals. Uh, I have a logbook for my swimming. I write down everything I did in practice, every set, the times I went, uh, what I was working on, how I felt that day. So it's a, it's a full page of journaling just for my practices alone. I save all those. My personal journals, which is what I do before I go to bed, I'll write down everything about the day, everything bad, everything good, everything I could have done better, everything I regret, what I'm looking forward to, who made me laugh, who pissed me off. And I actually throw those away because once those pages close, I said what I needed to say, I'm done with it, I can move on with my day. And it helps me in the day when I close the book. Wait a minute, so you, you, you document all of these feelings, all of these emotions, <laughs> And you, you just trash them? Yep. That day did its job and I'm gonna move on. Let me just play devil's advocate because I started several years ago when I had my first child and someone said to me, you don't think about it now, but one day your kids or your grandkids, they might want to read about how <laughs> no, no, this, no. <laughs> this great Olympian felt in the moment. Nope, no? No, my journal, no one gets to read my journals except me. 
Uh, I write things in there. there. There's probably some bad stuff about my wife I've written in there. There's probably bad stuff about my dog I've written in there. No one gets to read them except me. That's the beauty of how I journal. Yeah. It's whatever I say is between me and the journal. No one else gets to read it. And that's why I, I trash them and I'm done with it. Once I say what I need to say, it's a, more of a release for me, not something I need to look back upon. Perhaps you've heard uh, there are great expectations for Mr. Dressel this, this summer. What, what do you make of the expectations? I understand that's something that comes with the sport and trials for me. I am learning really quick. It does not get easier. The faster you swim, those expectations only get greater, but they're expectations from other people. It's not from within myself. So at a certain point, yes, I can feel that pressure, um, but I'm learning better and better every meet, every year, how to completely ignore them because they are irrelevant and they don't pertain to me in any way. You know, it's up to me, my relationship with the water and how can I get from point A to point B as fast as I can. So I don't care what times other people want me to go. I don't care how many medals other people want me to want me to win. You know, I've got my own goals. Uh, this is actually the first season I've shared my goal times with my coach. It used to be just within me. Um, after 2019 Worlds, I sat down with Coach Troy and we went over every split for every race that I swim. And he actually had goal times for me. His were actually faster than mine. It was kind of funny. That's why it's really fun to work with him. I remember looking at his goal times. I was like, really? Really? Is this for real? Because I set, I set the bar pretty high for myself. Yeah. You know, there's a fine line between, I think, goal setting and laughter. And it, mine's somewhere you know, right in that line there. Um, so his were a little quicker than me. But I wanted to be held accountable with what I wanted to accomplish. Um, and he's done that since I've worked with him for six years. But to have that on paper and have that out in the open with him, it took it to a new level. I would imagine you probably reached his goals. So the goal at trials is to make the team. Um, times are irrelevant. It's to get your hand on the wall first or second and to get shipped off to Tokyo. That was the goal, we accomplished that goal. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans, there is breaking news. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. I read that you're the fastest swimmer in the world right now. Were you aware of that? Um, yes. Well, you but have to know you're the fastest swimmer in the world. You know, I had a teammate who trained with me here. And every year, he'd end a meet, he'd be the best in the world. And he would take his name from the top of the leaderboard, he would scratch it out, and we'd write his name at the bottom. So for him, he knew he was gonna have a target on his back, but he wanted to be the one doing the chasing. So I would never view myself as being the top guy. I would never wanna get complacent with that. I wanna be the one doing the chasing. I know there's a huge target on my back, but I don't view myself as the best in the world because I know there's guys where if I get complacent for a second, I'm done. I read uh, that you were not wild about being compared to America's greatest Olympian, <laughs> Michael Phelps. Is that true? I don't think it's fair to Michael. Why not? He's a better swimmer than me. That's not my goal in the sport is to beat Michael. You have a guy who could swim a 4 a.m. He could have made, he could have won a gold medal in the two back. It never matched his lineup. He won a gold in the two a.m. to fly, 100 fly. He swam the 100 free on relays. You had a guy who could swim a sprint event all the way up to a 4 a.m. If you put me in a 4 a.m., I'm not gonna, I'm gonna struggle to finish the race. 
I'm a very different athlete than Michael. I'm fine with saying that. I'm pretty good at the events I do swim. I can beat Michael in a 50 free. Yeah. Can beat Michael in a 100 free and a 100 fly. Yeah. You know, I have some goals that I would like to accomplish to where I can consider myself to be great. And I don't have to compare myself to Michael to consider myself to be great. But you read these, these headlines. Caleb mm -hmm. Dressel, the next Michael Phelps. I've had the questions asked to me. I don't read the, I don't read the headlines though. Has, uh, has Mr. Phelps given you some, some sage advice? Yes, certainly. Yeah, I've, uh, I've leaned on him. You know, I'm not gonna say we're, we talk every day or we're, we're best buds here, um, but I know I can rely on him for anything. I know I can call him right now. He'll pick up, ask what I need. Um, so I certainly feel like he's passed. No, I don't wanna say pass the torch, but I know he's a reliable source that I can contact at any point, And I know I can lean on him as much as I need to. You know, I feel like he's, given the younger generation of the sport an opportunity to rely on him now that he's out of it yeah. for any advice that we need to get from him. The, the nature of his advice, is it related to, to technique or is it more just advice about? It's more so uh, stuff like this, handling. Um, handling guys like me, ha handling, <laughs> it's handling not, nosy no, no, reporters. No, no. It's, not, it's not you, it's yeah. not you. It's, it's stuff outside the water. Got it. Most comfortable I am at big meets, at trials, at the Olympics, at Worlds, is when I'm walking out to go to the blocks. It's the most comfortable I am. It's the stuff that I need, the stuff I need help with is outside the water. You know, I, and I'm sure if I texted him about technique, I'm sure he'd give me the honest, yeah. honest truth there. Um, but it's more so stuff outside the water. I think I can learn a lot from the guy. I get the sense that you're quite grounded and you don't really like talking about yourself a whole lot. <laughs> no. That's a fair assessment. It's very fair, yeah. Why is that? I don't know. Uh, I'm still trying to figure myself out. You know, I, I feel like I can give advice here and there with stuff that's worked for me, but I'm not sheltered. I'm not scared of the world. There's parts that I want to share. I feel like people can learn from, but for the most part, I'm happy. I'm happy with what I have. I'm happy with my inner circle. I don't need to share every bit of me with the world. I'm fine with people watching and supporting me, or I'm fine with people not liking me, I'm totally fine with that. You know, I'm not doing the sport to have the spotlight on me the whole time or to take the spotlight away from anybody. I don't care about that, it's irrelevant. If there was no spectators in Japan or no cameras, it would be completely indifferent to me. I'd be totally fine. You know, this sport, like I said, I do this for the challenge that it offers me. And the longer I've done it, the more challenges it's offered. Let's talk about Tokyo because you just, you just brought it up. Spectators, it's gonna be a different experience. How do you think that, that it's going to affect the way that you perform or will it? I don't think it will in any way. I do prefer to have people in the stands. Okay. I do like to put on a show. I want people to celebrate with me. I want to have that moment. I mean, at trials, it was awesome. As soon as I made the team at 100 free, like being able to sit on the lane line and get the crowd going, like I like that. But once I'm off deck, I'm over it. I don't need the crowd. Certainly prefer the crowd. And I love being able to share those moments with them. Your family is not going to be able to be there cheering you on in the stands. How does that make you feel? I certainly wish they were there. I'm, I remember that being the highlight from Rio. Getting off the award stand and being able to see my family up in the crowd. The people that got me to where I'm at, the people that have seen the struggles along the way and they've seen the mountaintops and the valleys. They've been through every part of my career. My mom, even when I had my license driving me to practice because I'm too tired, I was a baby. Um, you know, those moments, they've seen every bit of it. Yeah. They've seen me come home from practice crying. You know, they've heard me say how much I hate the sport at times, not all the time. Um, but they've just seen every bit of the sport and have it boil down to, you know, a race that lasts, you know, 40 something seconds. Mm -hmm. It's really sweet. And it was very emotional, you know, just having every emotion flood me at once and be able to share it with my family. That was a highlight of Rio for me. What was it like to win two gold medals in, in Rio? It's a tricky question. You think it'd be easy. I mean, of course I was, I was happy, but I'm certainly never satisfied. It's something that I know I need to work on. You know, as soon as I finish the race, I'm already analyzing how I could have been better. So for Rio, yes, the goal, of course, if you're on Team USA is to get your hand on the wall first, to represent your country the best yeah. that you can, to do your part in relays. So for me, yes, I was, I'm just going to say happy so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> yes, I was happy with the meet, um, but I know I could have been better. So, you're never satisfied. No, no. You think that's part of what drives you? Yeah, and I don't want any, anyone to think that like that's what's not something's wrong with me or something. Right. I just I'm never satisfied with the race, and it's not like, and I'm still enjoying it. 
But the fun part for me is showing up in practice. You know, once, you, once you're stepping up to the blocks for a race, hard part's done with. You get to go and have, and have fun. You know, 99% of what I do is training. And if you don't enjoy training, you're not in the right sport. Um, this is the fun part for me. I hear uh, that, that um, you've got quite the fascination with Legos. I love Legos. I've got a list of three things on my phone that I want right now. A really, really small list, but one of them is the Millennium Falcon Lego. It's like a thousand bucks. Since I was a kid, that was my thing, was yeah. Legos. Every Christmas present was some type of Lego. And I just never outgrew it. But if I feel like I deserve a Lego, yeah. after Tokyo, maybe I'll get the Millennium Falcon. I think that's, <laughs> that's the least you could do to reward yourself. You said there are three things on your phone that you want. One was the Millennium Falcon. What, what are the other two? Is it a Stetson cowboy hat? The Gus silver belly? One of them was a fanny pack. I got that one after trials. That was my gift to myself after trials. I bring a backpack everywhere. Yeah. But the only thing I realize, the only thing I carry in the backpack is my phone, my wallet, my keys. Right. So I just wanted something smaller and then it turned into what's the smallest thing I can possibly get. And it was, it was, a, it was a fanny pack, so. You really do march to the beat of your own drummer, Caleb Dress on <laughs> I'm learning a lot about you. Legos, cowboy hats, and fanny packs. Fanny pack. Yeah, uh, I guess that wasn't a very good sequence of events. Remember, I was supposed to be this elite athlete. Edit all that. Cut no, all that no, out. No, no, no. No, we're not editing that. This is definitely in the piece. <laughs> um, congratulations. Uh, you tied the knot in February. How has marriage changed you? It's been really fun with Megan. That's the first word that comes to mind. There's parts that have been challenging for sure. There's parts to where I've had to step up my game. I've had to be a better husband, a better man, because I want to do that for Megan. We're one person now. And the first time I heard that, as I feel like I should have researched this before proposing, was we were, um, we were on a meeting going over some counseling stuff uh, before the wedding. Yeah. And he was saying, you do realize you're becoming one person. I said, what? <laughs> I said, what? And it is. Um, and I really, it has felt like that. You know, me and Megan are, we're the Dressels. We're yeah. one person now. And it's been really fun figuring that out, figuring out date night, yeah. um, how much food I do consume, how much she needs to needs to cook because I cannot cook and she's amazing and she likes to cook. Um, but it's been fun. And at trial, she's had this is the first time since we've been married where I've had a big meet. She learns. I don't really talk to anyone at meets. So she, she after the meet was over, she's like, did, did I do anything wrong? Did I handle everything fine? I was like, you were fine. Um, I don't talk to anybody, so. Not even your wife? Not even Megan. I read that you, you took all social media off your phone. You use Instagram maybe about 15 minutes a day. Is that right? Yes, I, uh, I didn't use it at all during trials. So I opened it up after trials. Swimming has taken me 15, 15 plus countries. I've seen awesome traditions, awesome, cust awesome uh, you know, customs. I've seen so much that the sport has taken me to. I love people. Yeah. So I want to share what I can, um, but no, Twitter's gone, Facebook's gone, Snapchat's gone. Did you find that it was too distracting? I found out I didn't need it. <laughs> I know how to control myself and to not open up an app, but for me, I don't like baggage. I don't like having things I don't need. I don't want to carry around a full backpack when I can just carry around a fanny pack. Where are you uh, happiest? I'd say my number one favorite hobby is good people, good conversation. So I'm actually very much enjoying this right now. Yeah. <laughs> you seem like it. So am I. I hear that you're also quite the drummer. I do play drums. I got into drums fifth grade. Yeah. yeah. I went to a school where they required you to learn an instrument. And I started with piano, lasted a day. I said, that sucked. I'm tone deaf. So I uh, switched over to drums and never outgrew it. Same thing with Legos. I just kind of kind of stuck with it. So you still I, play? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I got my dream kit and everything. Yeah, I record stuff every now and then. I use uh, Logic Pro. I make music. It's a music software program. Yeah. So I'll make some songs every now and then. I can't sing. I'm not going to share the songs with anyone, but right. Megan, Megan's heard them. Some of my family have heard them. Friends have heard them. Oh, so you are singing on these songs that you share? Yeah, I know how to use autotune. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's your favorite band? It's a little cliche, but Blink-182. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? 
Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything for traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. What would you consider success in Tokyo? The questions you think are, are easy are really hard for me. I'll be happy with that meet, and I will consider that a successful meet. If I learn something to take and move forward in my life, I will be really happy with the meet. You know, of course, I would like to hit the goal times I have. But like I said, the 99% is done. Right now, it's about going and going and having some fun. What about the medal stand? No, it's not about that for me. I don't keep any of that stuff. You guys should be jealous. I get to do the fun part, which is racing. I get to enjoy the race. I don't want to hang on to I don't need a piece of metal to, to remind me of that. I got to enjoy it. I got to enjoy what was going through my head when I'm going through the water. I got to stand on the on the on the metal ceremony. I got to be in the village. I got to do all this stuff. That's all up here. I, I don't I don't need a piece of metal to do that. How did you get this way? I mean, you really do seem to <laughs> seem to have it figured out. I surround myself with good people. That's the only thing I'm going to give myself credit for. My mom and dad are my biggest, biggest heroes, biggest inspirations. Uh, I've got great siblings. I learned something from all of them. Where are the Rio medals? My mom and dad have one of them. I, g I gave one of them to them. Um, and I actually gave the other one away to a friend of mine who passed away since then. So I did, that one was given back to me, but it's, uh, that one is it's upstairs. I think it's, it's in a TV stand somewhere. It's upstairs, I think it's on the TV stand. Your Olympic gold medal is in a TV stand somewhere. Yeah. You know, most people put those on walls. No, I don't want, if someone's coming over to my house, I'm, no, no, we're going to hang out and play pool or foosball. I'm not going to walk you around and say, yo, check this out. No, I don't want that to be the reason you like me. If you don't like me after you have a conversation with me, you probably won't like me. So I don't want anything to, you know, blur yeah. that. You don't want to be defined by a couple pieces of hardware. No, that's, all, that's I know people are different. I don't want to disrespect anyone because... I could totally understand the other side of that does represent all those years of work. It does represent boiling down that moment of the race of being the best in the world at that moment. I, I completely understand that. But for me, I rather, I just rather give them away and have someone else to enjoy that moment. For me, I got to be in the race. You guys should be all so jealous of me. I really got to, I got to compete. You know, that is, that is the fun part. I got to learn something from a race. I got to stand on that podium. I got to take all that in with my own eyes. Yeah. I don't need that piece of metal. I'd rather be able to give that to someone so they can enjoy all the things I got to enjoy and that can be representative to them of what I got to enjoy. You don't need the medal, but do you want to win gold? Oh yeah. Okay. I don't want you to think I'm not competitive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just making sure. What I appreciate about you, and I don't get this in all of my conversations with folks, um, you're honest, which Doesn't, is probably why you don't like to do a lot of these. I try to be. That was our team rule. That's Troy's number one team rule is honesty. When you, you get to the pool, is, is there a ritual? There are things that I like to do, but I'm very flexible. Okay. 
So I do like to stick to my routine. You know how big I am on routine. I like to do those things, but I don't want to think if some competitor had the big idea to like steal my shoe that I would start freaking out or anything. It, there's not much you can do to mess me up. I do have a preference of the routine I like to stick with, but you could throw a curveball in there and I'll be fine. Like trials, I would warm up in the competition pool some days and then I'd go to the warm up pool some days. So it just depends kind of what I'm feeling. Okay. I go a lot of stuff I go based on feel. This whole The whole premise of the sport is feel. You hear so many swimmers talk about it didn't feel right or I felt good in the water. No one can explain it besides the word feel. That's that's the best we got. So a lot of what I do is based on feel. Music beforehand? Are you, are you jamming out to anything? I, I started. Um, I started, yes, to kind of, a lot of people started to get in my business a little too, too much. Um, so the easiest way to just put headphones on and then that way no one can really bug you. You get in, get in your business. Well, I, I, I'm not the nicest person when I get in meat mode, you know, I'm there to, I'm there to take care of business. And once that's done, I'll do whatever you want. But you know, the headphones help just get people away from me. Yeah. Block them out. Yeah. It sounds mean, but no, I don't want anyone to interfere with what I'm trying to do. Yeah. I don't think anyone can interfere with what you're trying to do. You, <laughs> you seem pretty focused. Yeah. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. What's it going to be like competing uh, with the pandemic as a, as a backdrop? I think it'll be fine. You know, there's a lot of things that are out of my control. So I'm not gonna worry about things that I have no control over. I'm sure the Olympics will be set up in a fine enough manner to where that's not even gonna be a worry once I'm there. Not nervous at all? No, nah. no. Nah. Are we excited? Yes. You are excited. I'm, I'm, of course, I'm excited. The, ner the nerves will hit later. Right now, it's just excitement. And, fo um, and focus. Nerves, nerves and, uh, or excitement and focus are right now. Nerves and focus come later. Okay. And excitement still, still hangs in there, of course. Welcome to Today All Day. All Day? Today All Day. All Day. This is a long oh, way of asking, man, yeah, who's your okay. favorite character you've ever all played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things. Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. My buddy cow cooking with me. That's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today, with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Okay. Look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look, look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Will you judge okay. us in a cook-off? I yes. will. And okay. you guys will definitely win something.
Hello, today all day, summer's almost here, and if you're looking for the perfect way to welcome warmer weather, my pal Anthony Contrino is sharing his favorite al fresco meal. Not al roca, but al fresco. We're talking juicy pork milanese, peppery arugula salad, an easy anti-pasti, along with Uncle Pasti, with olives, and of course, a classic Italian cocktail to wash it all down. Mmm. Summer is just around the corner. It's not one of my favorite seasons, but my birthday's in there, so I'll allow it. Anyway, it is gonna be really nice to be able to dine outside with friends. So today I'm whipping up the perfect al fresco meal. I'll be making delicious orange rosemary marinated olives, the juiciest, crispiest pork milanese that you've ever had, topped with a nice fresh salad. And then of course we need a cocktail or two. I'll be making a Negroni and an Americano. Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. Welcome to the new set of Saucy. Let's get cooking. I'm gonna be making some delicious orange rosemary marinated olives. We love olives in my family. We have them out for every holiday as part of an antipasti. I'm gonna be using orange and rosemary because those are two flavors that I like and that work really well together. So first things first, I have two different kinds of olives. My favorite, Caltavetrano, which are super buttery, and then a little bit more of a pungent flavor with Kalamata olives. I like the two to balance off each other and they're really pretty when mixed up together later on. For the marinade itself, we'll start by adding some oil. It's about a third of a cup. You can eyeball this into a small saucepan. So first things first, an orange. Any sweet orange will do. This is a plain navel orange, and I'm just cutting a few strips off. Then I like to go back with a knife and carefully, don't hurt yourself here, Similar to like filleting fish, remove the bitter pith. We don't need any bitter flavor in our marinade over here. So you can see all the white part is gone and you're left with just the beautiful, super fragrant skin. Right into the pot that goes. Take your time. Better off being safe than sorry with this. and the last one into the pot. Don't want this orange to go to waste. So I'm gonna take that sweet, delicious juice and we'll add that to the pot as well. That'll add a little bit of sweetness to our olives. Next up, garlic. Why, why does this happen every time? Six takes later. I'm gonna grab two cloves. You can buy them peeled already, which will save on the aggravation. Okay, so just thin slice, eighth of an inch, even thinner if you can, without hurting yourself, into our pot. Then let's add some more flavor. A bay leaf. I'm gonna add a pinch of red pepper flakes. I'm not a big spice person, so I literally just add a tiny little pinch. Last but not least, some fresh rosemary. So I'm gonna cut off a couple of sprigs here and pull off about half of the leaves or just kind of break them. I just like the way it looks when it's in there. It's still gonna permeate that oil. So I'm literally just waiting for the edges to just sort of start to simmer as I'm doing this. It'll go pretty quickly. We're not looking to cook, we're looking to infuse. You'll know it's done when it gets nice and fragrant. Similar when you add garlic and onion to like a saute pan and it's getting there, smelling really good already. So you can see it's starting to simmer a little bit. So I'm gonna cut the heat and then simply just pour it right on top of our olives. Make sure you get all of this flavor. Leave no speck of garlic or rosemary behind. Okay, now I'm gonna let this sit out at room temperature for a couple of hours. So every now and then, every time you pass it, just pick it up, 
Give it a toasty turn, zhuzh it up. Get those olives coated nice with that oil to help marinate it and give those olives some time to steep. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. If there's one thing that I can eat for dinner every night, it's pork milanese, or any milanese. Chicken, anything, pound it thin, fry it crispy, I'm gonna eat it. I'd probably even enjoy shoe leather if it was fried. So right here I have, from my butcher, you can get these at most supermarkets, some nice, beautiful, thick pork loin chops that are boneless. I'm gonna pound them nice and thin so that every inch of this milanese is absurdly crispy. Get yourself a generous sized sheet of plastic wrap. And this is where the fun begins, guys. This may look a little scary, but I promise you it's not. We're going to butterfly these chops. So, gonna place a chop on the plastic wrap, taking a really sharp chef knife I'm going to find the center, and I'm gonna cut it open like a book. Work slowly, deliberate, steady slices. And this is just to help get it nice and thin. And I'm just slowly going to start peeling it open. And there you go. If you skip this step and just start pounding, you're gonna be there all day and your meat's not gonna be as tender. So truly don't skip that step. Be sure to leave a little slack around so that our chop has room to grow. Get yourself one of these fun toys and go to town. Watch your fingers, don't do what I almost just did. There you have it. It's about a quarter of an inch thick and we have a gorgeous big cutlet now that is for one person. Just keep going. Did your kids or your boss piss you off today? This is the perfect meal to make at the end of the day. This one's even better. You can do this with chicken breast. I love it with chicken. You can do it with beef. If you don't have time to go to the gym, this is the perfect activity for you.
this what it feels like to exercise? <laughs> One to go. That looks great. As easy as that. I am going to wipe down, sanitize, clean my hands, and then we're going to dredge these guys up. Okay, now that that's set up, let's start getting these bad boys breaded. So, free them from the plastic wrap. Look how great that looks. Nice and thin. And when cooking, you wanna make sure you're seasoning in layers. You never wanna just finish with salt because it's just sitting on top and doesn't have time to absorb. Also, when cooking, you want to do all of one action at once. It keeps things neater, it's quicker. This is the bulk of the seasoning, so don't be cheap. And get both sides. The last one's always the annoying one, isn't it? Perfect. Now to begin breading. You may notice that there's something here missing, flour. Growing up, whenever my dad made chicken cutlets or milanese, he never used flour. And when I went to culinary school, I was like, "Where? What, what's with the flour? And I've tested it both ways. In this case, it is an extra ingredient, an extra step, and I find it to be completely unnecessary. It actually coats better to this pork if you don't use flour. So while you're probably thinking, I don't know what I'm talking about, I would curse here, but I'm not allowed to anymore. I definitely do. So this is my dredging station. Three very well beaten eggs and two cups of seasoned breadcrumb. Another trick, wet hand, dry hand. So in she goes. Make sure we're nice and well coated. You can see how great a pie dish works for this. It fits well, it has a flat enough surface and it has sides to keep everything in place. Give it a couple of shakes and right into our breadcrumb. Now, use your dry hand to start covering it with the breadcrumb. When you get to this point, you can flip it. Make sure you don't miss a millimeter of breadcrumb. Every crevice, breadcrumb and press it in. We want these to be well coated and super duper crispy. Just like that. And that's ready to be fried. Make sure you press it on, lock it in there. Isn't that cool? This is kind of a fun thing to get the kids involved in too. Put them to work. Dinner was not for free at my house growing up. Thank God I did most of the cooking. My mom's cooking's atrocious. That's a big one. Time to fry them up. I've added about a quarter of an inch of vegetable oil to a pot. When frying, I like to use a neutral oil like safflower, canola, any vegetable oil, because it won't take on any flavor. Have this going over medium high heat. And I know it's ready when I add a pinch of breadcrumb and we get some sizzle action. So you see how it foamed up and it already started darkening? Time to add one of our cutlets. Mm. 
We're gonna let this fry for about two to three minutes per side until it's deep, golden, gorgeous brown. Keep an eye on the edges of your cutlet. I can see it already starting to get nice and golden brown in that little nook, which means it's almost ready to flip. I'm gonna take a sneak peek. Almost there. For me, any cutlet should be on the brink of being burnt for it to be delicious. Now just another couple of minutes. Transfer it to a wire rack. If you put it on paper towels, it's gonna get a little soggy and the breading is gonna start to fall off. Get another one in really quick. And then while it's still hot, add a nice generous amount of a flaky sea salt. You can see it melting into that hot oil. Some of it won't melt. It'll add a little bit of an extra crunch and extra seasoning. These cutlets are gonna cook really quickly, so keep an eye on the pan. This is not the time to walk away and start another project. Oh my God. crispy for the chef. I have my oven set to the lowest setting. I'm gonna throw these in there to keep them warm. I don't wanna keep them in there too long though, just long enough to make a delicious salad. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now, it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. This peppery arugula is the base of my salad, but any good salad needs a killer dressing, and this is mine, my white balsamic dressing. Going to start by adding a couple of tablespoons of just plain old clover honey. This bougie thing looks like a lot of fun, but it's a little messy. This is gonna add just enough sweetness, some Dijon, which is gonna add more depth of flavor. It's also going to help emulsify this dressing when we add the oil. 
get that all in there. A little bit of salt, about a half a teaspoon, and then about an eighth of a teaspoon of freshly cracked black pepper. I'm gonna whisk this to combine. Make sure you get that honey to dissolve. That looks beautiful. Now that the base of our dressing is ready, I'm going to drizzle in olive oil. Very slowly begin to drizzle in your olive oil, giving it time to break up the fat molecules and emulsify. If you can see the oil puddling in the vinegar, that means you're adding too much and it's going to not emulsify properly. I did not sign up for this much cardio today. You can see it already starting to thicken. That means that we have a great emulsification. It's a beautiful dressing. Great golden color from the white balsamic and this really good Sicilian olive oil. Mm, gorgeous, gorgeous. Mm, it's perfect, it doesn't need any more seasoning. This is a very simple salad. All I'm going to add to this arugula are some beautiful cherry tomatoes that I'm just gonna have. If you don't have a small utility knife like this, a nice serrated knife, it's a really great kitchen tool. I use it a lot. I'm gonna give this a quick toss. And then add your dressing to taste. This makes more than you need for this, but it stores really well in the fridge, in a mason jar, or just any sealed container for at least a week. Mm. So all set. All that's left to do is to put the two pieces of the puzzle together. Mm. It smells so good. Okay. These are nice and warm. Let's go with this big guy. Just throw that right onto a plate and then don't be cheap. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Then because God forbid I cook something and not put cheese on it. How delicious does this look? I cannot wait to dig in. I'm kind of thirsty. I think I need to make a cocktail. Vaccines so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. I'm 
going to show you how to make probably the most quintessential Italian aperitivo, which is a pre-meal drink, something meant to whet your appetite. And this bitter campati is going to do just that. That is one of the three major components in this Negroni. This drink is equal parts campati, sweet vermouth, and gin, and it is going to punch you in the face. So I'm doing an ounce and a quarter each of these three spirits. This is our sweet vermouth to balance that bitterness just the slightest bit. And we can't forget about the gin. This is a London dry gin that I'm using. Then some blood orange. I like to peel it directly into my beaker to catch any oils that come out. And I'm just going to peel off a nice healthy strip. Add some ice. You wanna get this nice and chilled. It's also gonna dilute this the slightest bit. And stir, stir, stir. At least 20 seconds. Really let those flavors combine and let it chill throughout. Perfect. Get yourself some bougie ice. Mmm. So pretty. Then, every cocktail needs a garnish. Another strip of our blood orange skin. Give it a little twist. And then I kind of like to run it on the rim just to get those oils on there. Little extra hints and punch of the orange. Now, if you feel like this is a little too bitter for your palate, we're gonna make its less aggressive cousin, the Americano, which is pretty similar. We're gonna start the same way with a Campati, using an ounce and a half this time. And then the sweet vermouth. No gin in this one. So it's not gonna be quite as boozy. Perfect. Same thing. And stir, stir, stir. More bougie ice. <laughs> Isn't that such a beautiful color? Then, finally, we'll top it off with club soda. How beautiful that effervescence. Let's get about our little garnish. One little straw. There you have it, the perfect Negroni and the Americano. Can't wait to share these with my friends. Is a pretty color. Then a little twist. Thank you. You stir. I like that it it a little. Welcome. This looks delicious. It's beautiful. It's all pork milanese. Nice. Thank you, Anthony. You're welcome. <laughs> Women 
learn rules from women's magazines. I can't make a move without consulting Family Circle or Harper's Bazaar. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd have no idea what shade of red drives a man crazy. <laughs> Little hint, it's the one with the least amount of fabric involved. That is part of a stand-up set from Midge Maisel, played by Rachel Brosnahan in the hit Amazon Prime series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Brosnahan's performance in that role has earned the 30-year-old an Emmy Award and two Golden Globes for Best Actress in a Comedy. Born in Milwaukee and raised outside of Chicago, Brosnahan's professional life has been rooted in New York City, which serves as the setting for Mrs. Maisel. Rachel and I got together on a recent snowy day in New York for a safely distanced Sunday sit-down and something new for a pair of New Yorkers, a sightseeing tour through the city on a double-decker bus. I'm so excited. You got room for two more? <laughs> All, right. All right. I feel like we're in a movie. Is it snowing? <gasps> How oh romantic. This is magical. Wow. 13 years after moving here, Rachel Brosnahan still marvels at New York City. You sort of give off New York. Do you feel like you're a New Yorker? Thank you. My understanding is that the mark from New Yorkers is 10 years, but not one day sooner. <laughs> <laughs> this is my tour of New York's Upper West Side. Cafe Lala with the big scaffolding. Oh Boy, we got here fast, didn't we? Yep. Got the it's you've that got very mail energy. Hardcore, you've yeah. got male energy. Yeah. That's what I dreamed New York was like. You know, right. sitting by windows, drinking right. coffee, and right. looking out on the Upper West Side. Yeah. Most of New York, it turns out, isn't like that, but. <laughs> it's a little harder to live here than they tell you about in the movies. Or on television. The New York of the 1950s glitters in the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. The Emmy-winning Amazon series starring Brosnahan as a down-and-out housewife who finds a funny way of landing on her feet. She's 21 and dumb as a Brillo pad, and, and I'm not naive. I know that men like stupid girls, right? Uh, but I providing a colorful antidote to these gloomy times. Right before we sat down, we literally had the tape measure yeah. out, so we could have seven full feet between us. Seven, right I mean, overachieving, I appreciate that. Yeah, we, for you, we added the extra foot. Thanks, pal. Is it gratifying in some way to know how many people have been watching The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel during this time? Yeah, it's been so nice to hear that it made people laugh. The character at the center is someone who leads with hope and joy. I'm grateful to have been able to be a part of something that helps people escape for a minute. Something happened tonight. You'll work out with Cal where you're going to go. Who the hell is Cal? Where is Eddie? Now, Brosnahan is escaping into a different, darker era, the 1970s, for the new Amazon crime thriller, I'm Your Woman. She plays Jean, a woman on the run, after her husband betrays his partners in crime. Is anybody looking? Everyone's looking, and they're looking for you, too. It is Brosnahan's first starring role in a film, and her first time as a producer under her company, Scrap Paper Pictures. Jean is an ordinary woman of the 70s who's been thrust into these extraordinary circumstances. And I'm grateful that a woman like Jean has been centered in this genre that's so traditionally male dominated. And that's our director, Julia Hart. I like the way Julia described it. She said, I wanted to know what happened to Diane Keaton mm -hmm. in The Godfather once the door closed. Yep, this is a woman who lives primarily in silence. I felt like I didn't understand her when I first read the script. And for me, that's always the most important marker when choosing to take on a new part is that I, I don't get it. Yeah, but that's such an interesting way to put it. For you, some of that mystery is, is appealing in a character? Yeah, it feels like it's an exercise in empathy and, and, and a constant challenge, and it's always scary, and, and that's the dream. That dream took shape in New York, where Brosnahan, a born and bred Midwesterner, went to college and never left. Right there. I lived on the Upper West for a while. I lived on, on 83rd, and we shoot the Stage Deli Diner a couple blocks from where I used to live. Really good. Do not make me cry at the stage, Deli. We were living in this tiny, tiny New York apartment and auditioning all the time and just crossing my fingers and hoping that someone would, would take a shot. You haven't even asked my name yet. I, I 
apologize. It, it's Rachel. The first big shot came in 2013 when Rachel won a recurring and Emmy nominated role in the hit Netflix series House of Cards. Feels like killing me. I get it now. Why men rule the world? No high heels. But it was not until she stepped into Midge Maisel's shoes and dresses and hats a few years later that Brosnahan became a household name. Comedy is fueled by abandonment and humiliation. Now, who the hell does that describe more than women? Season four of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel starts production in New York this month. Have you gotten used to the yelling on the streets and people knowing who you are, where you go? Uh, no, I don't know. That, I'm not sure that's something you can ever get used to. It's always the, like, you know, six foot tall dude with this enormous beard. Oh, who goes, hey man, love the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I haven't played my hometown for a while. To play a character like Midge, who is not just an extrovert, but a stand-up comic, which is like the scariest profession you can yeah. have. How did you approach that when you first started? I, it's my worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's dreamy in that it continues to be a reach, and that's very exciting. I've tried a lot of things, lots of preparation. Yeah. Uh, Coffee, lots of coffee, <laughs> power posing in the mirror. I've actually tried really? it. Oh, what yeah. What is that? I've never done that. Oh, you know, you just stand with your feet firmly planted on the ground and put mm. your hands on your hips and hold your head up high and, and just hope that it comes to you. Hope the confidence comes. Do you still feel that little pit in your stomach when it's time to get up on the stage and be midge up there? It, yes. Yeah. I think when you feel like you have nothing to lose, you you just stand at the you know at the edge of the plank every day and and make the decision to to dive off and just see what happens. It is strange to see Times Square. Is the naked cowboy still naked? The, oh, Rachel! Oh. Rachel! Oh. Rachel! The naked cowboy! The naked cowboy! The naked cowboy! Oh hi! Aren't you freezing? Wow. Uh-huh. I don't know that I needed to see that. <laughs> I had a very New York moment once in the subway over here. I caught Elmo with his pants down peeing on the wall. Yeah. You are a New Yorker. <laughs> you are. That's what did it. <laughs> That's it for me. My name is Mrs. Maisel. Thank you and good night. I gotta say, she's a trooper too. I offered her a hat, a blanket, whatever she wanted. She said, I'm good. It was cold and it was snowy out there. That fourth season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is coming later this year. And I'm Your Woman is available now on Amazon Prime Video. Our big thanks to the great PJ Clark's restaurant for hosting our conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to the Sunday Sit Down podcast to hear the full length interview with Rachel Brosnahan. You can find it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get yours. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So. It's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine.
and good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Midge <laughs> is a woman who is reinventing herself uh, Ooh, at a time good. in her life when she didn't think she would need to keep reinventing herself. She's finding her voice in a brand new way. Everything is new. She's discovering who she is and what she wants, and she wears a lot of fantastic hats while she does it. Abe is, uh, you know, he's uh, he's a guy who has uh, high standards and high expectations, so he lives in, uh, you know, a, just a steady state of, of disappointment and, <laughs> um, and frustration. And, uh, but he's, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's a guy who's, who's like his daughter, He's a bit of a, a bit of a fighter, and uh, I think they're you know they they they're kind of cut from the same cloth in a way. For you? sure, yeah. And um, and he's just uh, he he's a man you know he's uh, he's just a man of his time. It's late 1950s from season three, 1960, and he's uh, he's struggling with a sort of cultural shift, shift in his family. So he's um, he's a he's a man in crisis right now. Oh man. I love Midge's first day of work. I love the moment where she tells Abe that she's going to work for the first time, and he uh, the job at B. Altman. The, yes, the yeah. job at B. Altman. Oh, yeah. um, and he he's trying to make sure that she has all her ducks in a row, and she's very excited to prove to him just how in a row all of her ducks are. You got a job. Yes. You have no resume. They hired me anyway. Do you know how to type? I don't need to. Okay. I also, I love everything in the cat skills. Welcome back to Steiner Mountain Resort. <laughs> You're home away from home. Oh, hi, <laughs> Polly. The cat skills is home for Midge. She's been going there her entire life. And it was nice to see a different, slightly more relaxed side of Midge. Yeah, I, I think my favorite scene uh, to shoot from the first two seasons and there were many many great moments but um, I think the first moment that that Abe sees Midge on stage oh, when she's man. performing and this boy he was my papa <laughs> I... and he he wanders into this um, club and not 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 knowing he's going to see her there of course and she steps out on stage, and he had no idea that this was that she was pursuing this line of work. And she starts talking. Uh, she she sees him and gets nervous. And shooting that an scene was fascinating. <laughs> well, it was your performance in that scene is just I, I just think it's stunning. The material was beautiful. The but the way Rachel uh, had to kind of have a foot in both worlds. That's connected to her her father and trying to do her act at the same time. It it was uh, it was just a really, it was a beautiful, beautiful scene. Thank you. It was kind of amazing for us to shoot because we, I've been doing stand up alone, really, for Susie, I guess, for the we, first two seasons. And that was the first time, I guess Joel saw part of that one set, but it really felt like right. the first time anyone else had ever been let into that world. And I was so nervous to do that for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a that was a big big moment for I think for both of these characters in the, in season 2. Yeah. Midge and Abe's father-daughter relationship is an evolving one. Um Amy Sherman Palladino who created the show always said to me that Midge is the kind of woman who aspires to be exactly like her mother. If all of her dreams came true, she would move a couple floors up in the same apartment building and uh, grow into her mother's dresses and, and have exactly the same kind of life that she had. And when everything explodes, I think she begins to realize that she actually has more in common with her father than she thought. And I think he begins to realize that too. They're, they have a, a totally different relationship post Joel than they did before. Right, right. And, and I think um, the, uh, even, even though it seems like Abe and and Midge are that the, the, there's tension and mm -hmm. and uh, in their relationship and they're they're somewhat take an adversarial stance. Mm -hmm. There's I think there's a real mutual respect. Yeah. Um, he is he is 
disappointed and shattered that her her marriage has dissolved. Um, but on the other hand, he is has feels a sense of of pride that she's an advocate for herself and that she's standing up for herself and that she has enough uh, you know feeling of self worth that she is uh, not just going to um, you know succumb to the whims of her 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 husband her ex husband. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite Midge quotes is during season two when she's talking about where comedy comes from and why women are great comics despite the fact that, that some men seem to think otherwise. And she talks about how comedy is fueled by oppression and lack of power and humiliation and sadness and disappointment. And then goes on to say, you know, by those standards, only women should be funny. Now think about this. Comedy is fueled by oppression, by the lack of power, by sadness and disappointment, by abandonment and humiliation. Now, who the hell does that describe more than women? It's one of my favorite, favorite lines in the whole series. What about you? Uh I, I just keep going back to that one scene. I think it was in season one yeah. when um, you moved back into our apartment. I mean, but you've been sort of staying out late, and uh -huh. and uh, Rose and I are sitting up, you know, <laughs> waiting up for you. Yeah. And I say, you know, your mother's been, your mother's been in the bathroom throwing up. Your mother vomited. I did not vomit. Well, she did something in the bathroom that took a very long time, and she did not come out looking happy. <laughs> It was, we were shooting this late at night after a long day, and we kept, I kept. It was definitely you. I kept cracking up. I think it took about an hour and a half to shoot. But Tony's such a consummate lines. professional that you kept cracking up really in a very small way. So Tony would go. But then I, I think I did Your one take. Vomited. I think I did one take without cracking up, and then you and then cracked I laughed. up, and then I cracked I up. I know. Touchdown. Every morning, ten times, not just now and then. <laughs> yeah, you know, the romper scene um, was, uh, I, I mean, I just sort of took it in stride. I thought, well, this is an unusual getup, but uh, I just committed to the whole exercise routine. And But the response has been just unbelievable. What have Every, people said? Everyone talks about that romper as if, um, you know, it, it, it's... <laughs> I know Marin suggested that, uh, yesterday that I um, that I do like a workout tape, Abe's, <laughs> Abe's romper workout. Oh my God, please! You know, please. And, and, and boot it on Amazon. I'm begging you. You know, and uh, I thought that's a kind of a good idea. I'll just make up a bunch of random stretches. But it has and, to be to the chick the chicken song. To the chicken song, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, the the response to the romper uh, is it has been has been just completely unexpected, and I'm convinced because what we because of the Emmy win this year, that that Emmy really belongs to Donna Zukowska, our costume designer. Well, she won one too. She did, but mine belongs to her too, because <laughs> none of the other actors in my category got to wear a romper, romper that se right. last season. But why do you think the show is so beloved? I, 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 I think it has something to do with it. Uh, you know, where it, it sort of takes us out of uh, the present time. It's kind of uh, it's refreshing. It's, it's a bit of a respite from from the uh, stresses that uh, of, the, of the current period that we're in. Yeah, it's and, uh, colorful and it's bright. It's, and yeah, and uh, you get invested in the characters and the in the relationships yeah. and the family, and and it's funny. I hope so. <laughs> it feels like there's something in it for everyone, which has been cool. I. I never could have expected to hear from so many different people, from so many different backgrounds, from different parts of the country and different parts of the world yeah. who all have completely different ways in. For some people, it's that Midge is a woman who is not apologizing for following a new dream and for being exactly who she is. And for some people, it's the family element, the relationship with the parents. Um, some people have had similar experiences to the one that Midge had with Joel where their husbands or boyfriends or fiancés have left unexpectedly and they found mm. themselves lost. Some people just love the costumes. There's a nostalgia for the time the period. Cars. And the cars. 
Yeah. It's been really cool to hear from so many different people why they like it. But, paper, but we don't know what the secret sauce is. Uh, yeah, really. no one knows what it is. But on paper, you would think that uh, this would be, this kind of material would just be sort of for a yeah. somewhat narrow demographic. Yeah. And yet the opposite has, has uh, occurred. And, and yeah. it's just... It's just a broad range of fans. Yeah. It's really satisfying. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. In the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Rachel Brosnahan stars as the feisty and talented housewife who takes a gamble as a stand-up comedian when her marriage falls apart. So the Amazon comedy set in New York in the late 50s is a huge hit. We're talking about eight Emmy Awards right out of the gate. Now it's the eagerly awaited season two, and the family is struggling with new decisions. Take a look. Don't think about it. I've been thinking about it since dinner yesterday. We've been without food for 24 hours. Some people never have anything but bread soaked in water. Oh, that sounds delicious. The sin which we committed before you went Notice your kid's been stuffing candy bars in his face the entire ceremony. We shall. His face is covered in chocolate. He looks like Al Jolson. Be quiet. We are in temple. That's right. And everyone can see that we're talking because these seats are fabulous. Only they were edible. Did you see Mara Weinstock? Six rows back. Oh, you got to get on this train if you're not already on it. Rachel Brosnahan, Tony Shalhoub, Baron Hinkle, Alex Borstein, Michael Zegan, and Kevin Pollack. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Yes. Wait a minute. Season two is already off and running. I can't help but think of that Emmy night. I, I actually went and rewatched it, you guys. It was the night where you guys swept, cleaned up, won eight Emmys. Will you just take us back to that moment for one second, Rachel? You won one, Alex, you won one, the show won, you won a ton of them. What, what did it feel like uh, in that moment? It was a complete whirlwind. I, I, well, I didn't know that we were that early in the show either. So it was suddenly like, <laughs> I, like I turned, huh? by the time I got up there, everyone was gone. You were backstage, Amy was gone. I sort of said hi to Tony and went up and blacked out. Were you shocked about just how much people have fallen in love with this show? It's interesting. It's an interesting time for the world to embrace a lot of Jewish people. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just live there for a Yeah. Minute. And when I was looking at the faces of the rest of the people in the audience, and I think this is, this is catching on. And Tony, you guys, you two actually have shot several scenes, not just around here, but you've gone to the Catskills, you've gone to Paris. What are you finding about the show's popularity, not just here, but around the around the world? Well, when we were in Paris uh, shooting the first two episodes, we were surprised that a lot of our Paris crew, the French crew, knew, knew and loved the show. We were being stopped on the street. And this was just based on just eight 
eight episodes of the first season. So it was amazing that it had, the reach was that that far, that broad. Rachel, I feel like your character was so ahead of her time. When I was watching this, I found myself nodding. I'm out, I found myself going like, you go, girl. You go out there and get it. What do you think it is about her that's resonating with so many women? I mean, I think she's somebody who's insatiably curious. Uh, she's self-empowered. Um, she's asking questions about the world around her. I think, you know, she's aspirational in some way because she shows that it's never too late to head down a new path. Right. To find your voice in a different way. So, Marin, when this show started, did you think to yourself, we got a hit, baby. I could feel it. Did you feel that? No. I, I, all I thought was, thank God, I have a job. <laughs> which works. And also, I started to hear who I was going to get to work with. And the idea that I could be this one's wife and this one's mom and to work with these people. And I, I honestly, you're just so honored to have a job. But then when you get to hear that you work with Amy and Dan, you just kind of go, thank you. Talk about <laughs> the chemistry is undeniable on the show. I don't know if it's you guys, if it's the writing. What What is going on? Is this, are you guys all right off script? It's definitely or, us. Is it all, <laughs> it's all you? <laughs> what? The writing is pretty damn good. <laughs> but what is, I mean, because I, I guess at the Emmys, you guys said we already shot season two and we kind of already miss each other. Describe what this camaraderie is like. I think we spend a lot of time, even at work, reminding each other, this is amazing, right? Yeah. This is crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're still in that mode. Uh, of being astonished for, for the great words, for the great eight-page scene wonders. You know, all, this kind of work just doesn't exist for the most part. And, and we're, we're just as curious as yeah. the audience is to see what happens to these characters. Well, you play the husband yeah. that was the jerk, <laughs> and your name is Joel. I have a Joel, too, in this. But I heard that the writers were saying that you are kind of your own little Nielsen ratings box. Like, you could tell how well the show was going to do by all the chicks who came up to you on the street and said, like, yeah. Joel! No, I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> but, uh, they're talking about me. I I, and Tony. Mine. It was me. No, uh, I used to get a lot of people coming up to me and being like, you know, you're, you're, I mean, essentially the jerk from that show. But now yeah. they just tell me how much they love it. And it's so nice, you know, just knowing that people are watching it and, yeah. and enjoying it as much as we are. I, mean, I just want to say, I think Susie's actually the most handsome man on the show. <laughs> <laughs> True. Well, Alex, I was going to say, it's you're so, so quiet and you are such a scene stealer, literally. Like when you show up, I just wait for you to drop like one of your, one of your bombs. You want you want you want an F bomb? Is that <laughs> Can I point out, too, that Carnegie Deli has created, like, its own sandwich that has to do with your show, and they actually distributed them into our control what? room. Yeah. Wow. The there maisel? Are, are, it's the maisel. The they're already, the maisel. Yeah, they're already yeah. eating it right down. So I guess, uh, well, actually, my better have guessed that it was brisket. Is that it, What is case? it, you guys? What do y'all know? What's the sandwich? Roast beef. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Close yeah. enough. Does it only cost about 50 cents? It costs 50 cents. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you guys, thank you. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news.
we go sailing together, just the two of us. We ski together. We do triathlons together. Meet Constantine Mavrudis and Constantine Mavrudis, a father and son who share much more than a name. We have actually been doing triathlons together for about 20 years. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Is, is the know. dynamic competitive or do you? No, 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 I can't on? compete. With, no, I can't compete with him. He's he's just, he's too fast. Come on, Constantine, you got this, buddy. Come on. You're looking good, buddy. Come on. The younger Constantine, who goes by Const, might best his dad in a race, but he's following his father's footsteps in a big way as a pediatric congenital heart surgeon. In many ways, it's kind of like being a mechanic. I mean, you're, you're, you're taking apart an engine, you're putting it back together, you know, you're hoping that it works well in the end. With a 40-year career, the elder Constantine is one of the field's most prominent doctors, now saving lives at Peyton Manning Children's Hospital at Ascension St. Vincent in Indianapolis. Sometimes these hearts can be no bigger than a large uh, chestnut. It's up to people like Constant and I to fix them. Const started picking his dad's brain about hearts at an early age. There were times that I remember you, know, you go to restaurants that have you know, the paper instead of you know, the cloth uh, uh, on the tables. And I would ask him questions about heart disease and he would draw little diagrams. <laughs> But the boy, curious about hearts, almost became an orthopedic surgeon instead. I really didn't want to do what my father does. And tell me about some of the reasons why you didn't think you wanted to do what your dad did. It's tough. I'm, uh, when your father literally wrote a textbook, uh, <laughs> so when you know people can say you know he wrote the book on it, uh, he kind of did. Uh, that that can be that can be difficult. But in the end, I mean, it was it became something that I just couldn't I couldn't resist. He's now finishing his residency at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and together they're only the fifth father and son ever in this profession. It's a pretty rare connection uh, that we have, and the fact that we have the exact same name um, means that you know, I get his emails, sometimes he gets mine. Uh, he and I talk a lot about what uh, went wrong in an operation or what could have been better. It gives me a great opportunity to have this wonderful connection with my father. But when it comes to the heart, there are bigger lessons a son learns from his dad. There were two major maxims uh, growing up. One was remember your last name, uh, and the other was be aware of others. My wife and I are, are pregnant, uh, and these are kind of the, the major things that I'm going to try to, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Yay, congratulations. <laughs> Uh, these are the things that, that she and I uh, value very highly and are going to do our best to impart to our children. What sort of values did, did you want to instill and, and what do you see in him? Well, he would be the first to say you lead from the front, you lead by example. I have pride, but I didn't take his exams. I didn't do his residency for him. He did that himself. If there was anything that I did, I maybe held up uh, an example. And what do you want to see for, for his career going forward? Oh, he's already doing it. God bless him. I just hope that I live to 120 to see it all. Oh, I couldn't love it more. Oh, my gosh. They were such a great father and son to, to have this conversation with. And one of the things that Const says also inspired him, his dad came home from work happy oh, every day. Nice. And, you know, even with the ups and downs of, of the business that they're in, um, there could be some tough days. But But he, you know, they, they would talk through those and... Most of the time, his dad was happy. That's Pediatric right. hearts, you're an angel. Yeah. Pediatric hearts, are They're doing God's work. It's amazing. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them, doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it.
good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Anybody you know, and one thing they'll probably tell you is they are super, super busy. Whether you're taking care of kids or taking care of older parents, it can all be exhausting and overwhelming, and you might be missing some of life's best moments. But you know what? It doesn't have to be that way. Clinical psychologist Shafali Sabari is the author of The Awakened Family, and she says it's all about being present and conscious in your daily life. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank Great you. To see you. So and by the way, here. the Dalai Lama wrote the foreword to her book. So you're mage. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Well, you know what's funny? I think we sprint through life. Andy and I have been talking about this, too, in the makeup room. We're sprinting through life, and we're missing life. Like, we're trying to do yeah. everything, and we're missing some of the most important things. I think we, we're all on that train. Well, and that's why when you have a child, an infant, and I know both of you are new parents, that's when you begin to realize that life is to be lived in the moment, you know, and to center yourself and to get grounded in the moment. And infants especially teach us to do that, to drop the doing yeah. and to just enter the being. And mm -hmm. what is a tip that you can give us about being conscious as a family? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, conscious parenting really speaks to the fact that the real children we have to raise are mm -hmm. the ones within us. Hmm. And to become conscious of all our own emotional baggage and keep it out of the room. And the more we heal ourselves, the more we'll be present and not put our stuff onto others or our children. Well, you know, it's funny. I was walking down the street with Haley one day, and I still remember it because she declared to some stranger on the street, like, oh, I have pockets. And I remember I looked at her, and I could have been like, great, honey, you have pockets. Let's go. Come on, we're late, we're late. But for a second, I just sat in it. And I remember it, and I remember it right now that that happened. And there have been so many other instances where we've been in a rush. Great, great, sweetie. I know you're pretending. Yay, yay, yay. We got to go. Right. Take her hand right. and run. Right. We're all on this rush to nowhere. Yes, to and nowhere. Where are we, go where where we are rushing we to? Right. Right. Because we're incessantly anxious. One you know? of your um, things that you talk about is that parents need to give up their need to control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they do that? <laughs> well, the, the traditional parenting paradigm is all about control. And these children are my children. They're yeah. my possessions. So what I try to teach and espouse is that they just come through you, as Khalil Gibran <laughs> said, and they're not, yours. they're not yours. So they are their own sovereign beings. So when you understand that they have their own destiny to unfold into, and your role is just to be an usher and a guide, that then you won't micromanage them and hover around them because that just speaks to your own anxiety. It's never really about the kid. It's about our own anxiety that leads to this control. Well, what if it is time to go to bed? And I want to put, it's time for, for yeah, her to go to the, bed. The parent's role is to right. create to, a schedule and yeah, a right, right. structure. So creating a container is very different from being in control and oh. imposing a sort of agenda that comes from your own deep-rooted expectation. Of course you contain, contain them and you have a schedule and you try to abide by it, but you also work in a negotiated way with your child. You know, And I think parents forget that our children need to be allowed to unfold into their own. Yeah, you know, we're too busy trying to, yeah, yeah, to microform them, them. And slot them into little boxes of time. How can Hoda make bedtime more enjoyable <laughs> for little Haley Joy? Well, I think bedtime is really one of those sacred times. Yeah. I, and I know we're so exhausted. Yeah. I used to call it the witching hour. Yeah. You're good, you're good, you're good. And then after one minute after nine and you become a real yeah. lunatic yeah. Right. because we're exhausted. So we have to prepare for that time. You know, we have to have good boundaries during the day, take care of ourselves. Right. Because that's the time our children want to connect. And they don't right. want to leave Rush us. Right. And they right. Don't, right. they're having separation anxiety. Yeah. Right. So we need to prepare for this sacred bonding time. Oh, that was great. Thank you. Thank we you really so much. You. you can find The Awakened Family on today.com slash shop. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it.
It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. A recent Gallup survey found about one in six Gen Z adults identify as part of the LGBTQ community. So as you can imagine, the coming out process affects countless families. But each story is unique, and I sat down with two families to talk about their journey to embracing their LGBTQ children. Take a look. It was kind of like a weight lifted off of me, but it kind of brought, opened up a whole new can of worms. Seven years ago, Miles Foster sat his parents down for what would be a life-changing conversation. He told them he was bisexual. We were thinking, well, what does this really mean? Miles was just 15 at the time, and for his parents, Rodney and Valencia Foster, the news came with a wave of emotions and concern. He's a young black man, and now you're part of the LGBTQ community. So now you're talking about two different ways that people can discriminate against you. We've already always looked at Miles as the answer to God's prayer. When he came out, I was like, well, wait, this is this blessing from God. This, this doesn't make sense. The Los Angeles-based family struggled to figure out how this could all fit with their own church community, which had largely supported a ban on same-sex marriage. Every time we went to church on Sunday, we're hearing gay people vilified. I knew that there was something wrong here. I, I, I wasn't in conflict with God and with my son. I have to choose my son or choose God. It's like, so I chose both. Valencia and Rodney each took their own paths to a better understanding of their son and their faith. I went and found some other group of Christians that were outwardly gay, but also Christian. And they helped me out and we started to talk. I found a Facebook group of moms who were women who mm -hmm. were also trying to reconcile their faith and their child's identity. While the Fosters are now closer than ever, Valencia still wishes she had reacted better when Miles first came out. We said we love him. We said we support him no matter who he is or who he loves. But, you know, there were nights where I was crying in my room. Valencia, I see that there's still raw emotion to this. Looking back on my initial response, I still feel like I should have just celebrated him for just even for the courage and thinking about him going through what he was going through all the years before he said something. I just wish I had more of a soft landing for him. Valencia and Rodney have since become advocates for the LGBTQ community through the organization Free Mom Hugs. I'm very blessed to have been born into this family. I feel very lucky every single day. For Carl and Kristen Horton of Austin, Texas, their teenagers coming out felt more like an education. He did a PowerPoint for us, yes. like projected it to the screen. I didn't know if they were gonna understand what I meant when I said, I'm trans, I'm gender fluid, I'm non-binary, whatever. I thought it was a school project <laughs> and he was explaining what gender fluidity was. And at the end, he, the he, was like, no. I'm like, why do we have this presentation? Because I'm gender fluid, I'm trans. I was like, oh. Clay was assigned female at birth and his parents sometimes had a difficult time adjusting. I would have been surprised if someone told me the worst thing is gonna be when they change their name. We chose a name that 
was, um, had you know, had a lot of meaning. It was Carl's um, grandmother who we loved dearly, but we also recognized that this was part of the process. It was really hard for my mom. She was really worried about transitioning and what that meant for pregnancy later on. Clay is such a caretaker. I always associated that with someday Clay being a mom mm -hmm. and being able to switch that and to be able to say, okay, so Clay may be a dad someday. Both Carl and Kristen have since joined PFLAG, a group of parents, friends, and allies to the LGBTQ community. I think the biggest aha for me was other dads who were there who were really struggling with the same challenge. And, and, and much of it was the basic of like safety, physical safety, mental health, spiritual health, and making sure that our kids were able to spread their wings and blossom. My parents have taken like up the torch and have really continued to work to make our community safer for LGBT kids, which I'm really proud of. How would you describe the person Clay is today? Messy. <laughs> Clay is the same person, just uh, just better. I don't see fear in Clay's eyes anymore. I do hope he knows how much I love and respect him, but I, I also know that it was a pause. And I wish that I didn't have a pause of, you know, from being informed to being supportive. How is your relationship with your parents today? It's really good. Uh, I'm still, 20 years old, so I won't say that we don't fight over stuff, like who's using the car when, but I always feel like they'll have my back. No matter what happens, they'll still be there to help me. These two families' journeys actually brought them closer together in the end. And for more stories like this and original content about the LGBTQ community, go to today.com slash pride. Okay, those were yes. beautiful stories. I still uh, struck by how the parents said, I wish I would have done better. It yes. seemed like they did so, so well. Uh, but I it know. was all about love. Yeah. And you know, the key is to, I think they were always close-knit from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. They're just oh. very beautiful yeah. families. Okay, so coming up next, some advice and lessons for all parents on the best ways to support our kids. Right after this. Before the break, we met two families who shared their coming out journeys. Yeah, which led us to ask if your child comes out to you, would you know what to say and do? Or better yet, would you know what not to say and do and still show your love and support? So we called on the experts, of course, for advice. Psychiatrist Dr. Janet Taylor is with us and family therapist Linda Reeves. She's the co-founder of the Manhattan Beach P-Flag chapter and the proud mom of a gay son. Welcome to both of you. And Linda, I, just to start with you for a second, I think Jen and I were both struck by how those parents that we just saw in that piece had such beautiful responses, but yet they felt like they could have done better. What could they have done better? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that their stories were both so beautiful and um, the, the loving and caring is always gonna be number one, no matter if you kind of have a feeling uh, about it or if you're shocked. And I think a lot of parents, um, don't really aren't, aren't prepared right so what you want to do is just always lead with love mm -hmm. and uh let them know that you love them and that you support them and that you'll be in their corner always mm -hmm. which is what those families did and, yeah. and you say that you when your son came out to you you even wished you had you of yeah. course said i love you and yeah. you but that you wished you had done things differently what do you wish you had done that parents watching now can take notes of you know, I think one of the things, well, there's a couple, but the, one of the things is that parents don't really understand how long that the child has been living mm -hmm. with uh, these thoughts and these and, and worries, right? They're really so uncertain about how you're going to respond, if you're going to uh, believe them, if you're going to support them, uh, where religion is involved. That's a huge factor that a lot of kids really struggle to, their, their family's religious, like the one example. So what I really was looking back is that I had spent more time asking my son what it had been like for him mm -hmm. to have, you know, go to bed at night with his head on the pillow, mm -hmm. worried about what he was going to oh. say, when he was going to tell us, how he was going to tell us. 
Um, so I think there's a lot of trauma that parents don't really understand that kind yeah, of lies behind yeah, the surface. Yeah, Dr. Taylor, I think a lot of um, parents try to be kind of cheerleadery after they hear this. Either they'll say something like, well, well, I always thought that. Yeah, I always suspected I that or I knew it all along. Or else they kind of quickly get on the bandwagon with rainbows and everything. Um, and I think they, they go to the other extreme. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. And the fact is, you know, so often we think as parents, we have to protect our children mm -hmm. and that when they come out that, you know, by protecting them, sometimes we will have to really look at our own judgments and what we are protecting them from. It's not a time to feel sorry for them, but certainly to create a space that they can talk to us. And what we want to do is take their lead, but also acknowledge how you feel. So it, 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 it's also time not to bash yourself mm -hmm. because, you know, as both families showed, even though something is really difficult, they both be, they all became better. And that is the goal. So don't be too hard on yourself, but certainly create that space for your children to talk to you. Okay, should we talk about the do's and don'ts? Y'all yeah. have some really good do's and don'ts. Um, Linda, can we start with you? What should we do and what should we not? Well, I think a lot of uh, parents are concerned um, that their child uh, really knows what's going on. Uh, so believing your child, you know, that it is their truth. Uh, it may be an evolving identity story that, that they're or journey that they're on, but don't question them or, or make comments about that they're not old enough to know or experienced enough to have, you know, to make this kind of declaration. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Taylor, yeah, what do you? What are some things that parents should stay away from? Because I think some parents may be shocked when they hear the news, and mm -hmm. their first reaction isn't to wrap their arms around them, even though it should be what they do. Yeah, so don't label, don't judge, certainly watch the language that you use and take the opportunity. It, it is shocking and maybe painful for some parents. And again, you have to be with that, but also really ask your child or your teen open into questions. Ask them, you know, questions like, what do you want me to know? How can I help oh, you? Um, yeah. Educate yourself as a parent. Look at documentaries, read, join supportive organizations like PFLAG so you realize you're not alone and really are informed to partner with them as they take this journey. Yeah, I think some parents say, well, I, I love you no matter what. Well, that's no matter what is not great. Yeah. That's like, you and know, I also despite think this. One of the great um, yeah. pieces of advice you all have that we that we should get to really quickly is to ask questions and to yes. listen. Yeah. You know, yeah, Dr. Taylor. Yeah, certainly you want to ask, not assume, and listen from a place of understanding, not thinking about what you're going to say next, mm -hmm. even though it, it may be completely different with how you grew up and what you think, mm -hmm. but listen mm -hmm. to understand and certainly with love. And I loved how those families found a space for their faith mm -hmm. part of their life and the family part of their life. Uh, you guys, thank you thank so much. You. This was really enlightening. We appreciate it. And good evening from New Orleans, there is breaking news. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Breaking news. Mom, are you ready to become a grandmother? I am absolutely ready. What kind of grandma are you going to be? I will spoil, I will treat. 
But mainly, I can't wait until she gets old enough to go shopping. <laughs> Dylan, you are expecting your third. We're working our brain around the logistics of living in a New York City apartment with three boys, but you know, the excitement of, of meeting someone that no one has met. Laura, who's one of my oldest friends, knows what it's like to be the mom of a girl. She has two girls. Zoe is going into sixth grade. She is graduating from a cubby, we say, to a locker. She's going to have homeroom. I don't know if I would know how to be a mom to a girl. You would learn instantly. <laughs> <laughs> my girls are, they're pretty mellow. I think what my husband and I are anticipating are all of the, the hormonal and all of the changes that'll come when they're teenagers. Julie, what exactly was Kristen like as a child? Was she mellow? <laughs> no. Once I got a call from nursery school that Kristen had broken her leg because she was pretending to be Wonder Woman and jumped off a chair. No, so that shows you how active she was. What did you learn that, that you would pass along to my daughter? Well, I would just tell your daughter to be herself just as we wanted you to be yourself. Dylan, what are some of the lessons you've learned along the way? There's such an, a, a roller coaster of emotions that you're going to go through because at first it's like this sweet smelling, amazing little just bundle of, of love. And then after several nights of losing sleep, your mind starts to go crazy. You know, I would think, um, oh, she needs music. And then be like, oh wait, that's too much music. She needs some <laughs> movement. Oh, that's too much movement. And this like quest to find the perfect balance. When she slept through the night, I got up in the morning and panic set in. Did you ever have a moment like that where Zoe and Una slept through the night and you thought, what's going on? Oh, absolutely, except I was like, this is wonderful. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were becoming a mom yes. and the business world was not as supportive of working moms. Was that That's tough? Yes, I didn't know it was tough because it just seemed very natural for us to be together. I just went to work with you. You just went yes, right I put her in her you. little basket, sat her on the desk, and did real estate. You're an educator, Laura, in Hawaii, and you have really passed along a love of education and reading to your two girls. I used to have books in the car, and I used to read stories when they were eating. It really did kind of set this love of stories and reading into my girls. And so when they'll be at the dinner table, they'll bring their books, and I'm like, hey, we're eating. When you first bring that baby home and you think, oh my goodness, I'm so worried. Dylan, what's the best advice? Can I answer that first? Yes, you Go can. ahead. The best <laughs> advice is to call your mom. <laughs> you need your mom. You need, you know, Absolutely. you need the grandparents around because they know everything and you know nothing. But there's this moment of you just want it to be you and John and look at each other and say, we got this. You know, I'm actually gonna share some Julie Welker advice where she taught us, this too shall pass. And I think that's so true with children. The issue of this hour is gonna change to the issue of the next hour. Right. How do you preserve it, mom? Record it, you know, write it down, take photos. And again, the most important thing is to spend as much time with her. And I love you so much. I love you too, mom. And Dylan and Laura, I love you guys too. <laughs> Whew, so that's a little emotional to watch back. Dylan, such great advice. Thank you for being a part of that conversation. For what My it's mom worth. My mom loved it. Laura loved it. There's, there's also, I mean, no advice that you can honestly give to, to a new mom because you're, you're going to just figure it out yourself. I know. Well, I've learned so much from you and you, Peter, a dad to the two most beautiful girls. You've got you've got two babysitters blocks away if you need us at any time <laughs> we are there. But honestly, as much preparation as you did for that debate about a year ago, <laughs> you are more than you could possibly pre prepare for this. We are so thrilled for you. We've been giving you as many pieces of advice and gifts as we can. So the gift I have as you depart today Another one? is less for the baby and more for you and John because it is the start <laughs> of summer and you guys entitled a little moment to celebrate Aww. yourselves. So a toast to you guys. 
guys Aww, a little margarita you. cocktail kit. That is so sweet of you. We get one more margarita because yeah. <laughs> no more. The then it's day. game on. <laughs> exactly. It'll help you it get some sleep on. in the final days. I want here. both of you to be prepared for lots of middle of the night phone calls for me, asking for yes. more advice. Text you guys have just showered me in love. I'm so grateful. Text me anytime. And I also want to say you'll never have enough onesies or diapers. They'll they'll spit up. You know they'll make a mess of all of them. But this one you might want to you might want to save to the side. Oh, no. You don't really want to stain this one just in case you're Dylan, missing Peter while you're gone. It. We'll I'm that. pinning that up on the nursery. We'll leave that one in the drawer, I think, for a little while. Dylan, appreciate that very much. And this morning, we are kicking off the series, marking the milestones of the community and also the ongoing struggle for equality. You know, we start with the journey through the HIV AIDS epidemic, nearly 40 years to the day since the first case of AIDS was diagnosed in this country. NBC News Now anchor Joe Fryer sat down with those who lived through the crisis. Joe, good morning. Hey there, good morning. So it was June 5th of 1981 when the first five cases of a mysterious disease were first reported, a disease that would later become known as AIDS. Since the the disease has claimed more than 700,000 lives in America, and today more than 1.1 million people in the U.S. are living with HIV. Now, many are undetectable, healthy, and thriving, including actor Billy Porter, who recently became public with his diagnosis. This morning, we want to reflect on four decades of pain and progress. At first, the deadly intruder did not have a name. The lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic of a rare form of cancer. But it quickly developed a reputation. And the deaths kept coming and coming. The fear was palpable. I was terrified of passing on HIV to someone else. But in the years that followed, it was pretty miraculous for me. So was the bravery. Because of them, I can live a healthy and happy life. <laughs> we sat down with four wow, gay nice men from four nice different nice. generations, all living with HIV. The oldest is Jesse Milan, who's still haunted by the beginning of the epidemic. People who, because they had been diagnosed, suddenly disappeared. And, and we all knew what that silence meant. Jesse was diagnosed in the 80s after losing his partner, George, and so many others. It was hard. It was very hard. At the time, many leaders were accused of ignoring the crisis because it was deemed a gay disease. AIDS! President Reagan didn't give his first major speech on AIDS until 1987, six years after the first diagnosed case. We must have a definition of AIDS. For Dr. Anthony Fauci, the epidemic was a turning point. In 1984, he became the nation's top infectious disease expert, the same job he holds today. When there is resistance, was it hard to get the resources you needed? Well, in the beginning, it was. I mean, we, we, we were trying to convince people that this was not something that was going to go away. This is something that was going to get worse and worse. To raise awareness, the AIDS memorial quilt was unveiled on the National Mall. Joe Fratini. His organizers read the names of those who died. Some shared their stories publicly, including actor Rock Hudson, Teen Ryan White, who tested positive after a blood transfusion, real world star Pedro Zamora, and basketball legend Magic Johnson. In 1995, a combo therapy known as the AIDS cocktail was ushered in, followed by even better medications offering hope. But there was no cure for the stigma. Right now, there are millions of people with HIV suffering from social rejection because they and other people believe that they're infectious and, and they're not. Diagnosed in 2003, Bruce Richmond says he was terrified of giving HIV to someone else. So I, I didn't love, I just, I, I isolated myself. I was depressed and at times I was, I was suicidal. But then he learned medication could reduce his viral load to undetectable levels, meaning he couldn't transmit the virus. So Bruce started an advocacy group and coined the phrase, you equals you. Undetectable equals untransmittable, a message endorsed by the CDC. It gave me hope. It meant that I could be, I could be intimate. People with HIV can live healthy lives and, and not pass on the virus to anyone. And that's a revolution. Today, about 38,000 Americans are still diagnosed each year. DeAndre Moore was 19. 
remember staring at a window covered in butterfly stickers. In that moment, all I could think was, TM, if, if I could be one of those butterflies and just fly away from here, then everything is going to be okay. Ray F. Durazi had a similar reaction. He was 27. So I knew next to nothing about what it meant to be diagnosed with HIV. It was a steep learning curve. And what did you learn? <laughs> well, I learned that I'm not going to die. I'm, I'm alive and well. You think back to that moment with the butterfly, what would you tell yourself in that moment? You're going to be OK. You're going to be just as beautiful. <laughs> Today, all four of these men are undetectable. And all are advocates sharing their stories to educate the public and fight the stigma. It's taken us 30 years of the AIDS crisis to teach the whole world that our lives and our loves are equal to everyone else. It blows my mind just how far we've come and then just what's possible now, so. But what is possible now? <laughs> my mind immediately says what isn't possible. That's the answer. Another key breakthrough in recent years, PrEP. It's a daily pill that people who are HIV negative can take to prevent getting the disease. As for an HIV AIDS vaccine, well, that has not happened yet. But Dr. Fauci tells me he is cautiously optimistic that someday we will have a vaccine that is successful. 26-year-old DeAndre Moore, who you saw there, hopes that he is someday going to be part of an AIDS-free generation. And we want to give a big thank you to three organizations that helped us with that story there, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, AIDS United, and the Prevention Access Campaign. It's incredible mm -hmm. to see how far we've come in those decades. We all remember those scenes mm -hmm. in the 80s, but there still is a stigma. Isn't that what you learned? Yeah, there is. And it's actually kind of amazing, especially with young people, which is surprising. So a recent survey of HIV-negative millennials found that nearly a third of them say they avoid hugging, talking to, or even being friends with someone with HIV. People living with HIV often report being hesitant still to openly share their status because they fear losing friends or family or they even fear abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, or mental. Just reminds us of Billy Porter I'm just, just last that. week yep. who, just, who just announced what it. What a big he, sign of bravery yeah. even now. It's needed now, right. yeah. just as more than before. And he waited 14 years, waited to tell his mother, mm -hmm. so that stigma is still there. Right. Yeah. Joe, thank you. Story. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! And good evening from New Orleans, there is breaking news. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. This morning, we're lucky we're joined by a powerhouse <laughs> Hollywood producer. Will Packer is behind films like Straight Outta Compton and Girls Trip, and now he's sharing his knowledge with a new generation of filmmakers. Will is partnering with NBC Universal for the Scene in Color film series. It's sponsored by Target and promises to be an incredible opportunity for emerging stars. And Will, thank you for sticking around <laughs> through all of that. We're so glad to have you this morning. Sorry, you had to see that. Are you kidding me? Listen, I'm here for the vintage Chanel footage. That's Thank why you. I'm here. Thank you, Will. <laughs> so are we. I love it. Look at good. The glow up is real. Thank That's what you. I was the glow saying. up is real. I'm putting that on the show. I love that. All right. Well, um, besides <laughs> Chanel's vintage footage, um, tell us more about this scene in color uh, film series and why it was so important to get involved. 
Yeah, it's really cool. I got to tell you guys, I'm so excited about it. It's really a continuation of work that I've been doing for for almost 30 years since I made my first film, which is trying to make sure that we get underrepresented voices in our industry, people that would not have the opportunity. So we scoured everywhere. I'm talking film festivals and online forums to find three amazing up and coming black filmmakers. And that's what we find. We found they won this contest and now they're going to have their work featured across NBC Universal and all their platforms. Target is a big sponsor of this. This is an example of corporations doing the right thing, supporting folks and putting their money where their intentions are. But these new filmmakers, remember these names, Addison Wright, Eureka Dawson Amoa, Christian King, this is the next generation of filmmaker that we're going to be hearing about for a very, very long time. This is when we're at our best, right? This is, you know, the new global mainstream is yeah. multi-perspective, multi-ethnic, multi-racial. This is the important thing. I'm proud to be a part of this work. Really. And, right. and Will, is, is the point of this to get the pipeline going where you bring in this next generation who will bring in the generation after that? And now we've, we've kind of uh, seeded a whole new group of people with a different voice. You got it, Al. That's it. That's what we have to be doing is bring because, see, the thing is, you can't just create like a new filmmaker, a new voice, new perspective and have underrepresented people have an opportunity to create their stories. If the pipeline's not there, if you don't take filmmakers who are just starting out, who are just aspiring and give them a true chance at mentorship, get them a true chance to see their work be seen on the largest forums and the largest stages. That's how you create a pipeline so that now in the years to come, we we will have an industry that looks far more diverse than it looks now. That's the work that's being done. And, and switching gears really quickly, we're looking behind you. We've got girls ship there behind you. We talked earlier about, you know, straight out of Compton, Stomp the Yard. First of all, really quickly, is there going to be another girls ship too? Everybody was tweeting <laughs> and texting me, asking me if I'll ask you. Hey, uh, let me tell you something. Here it is. Right now, okay. you're going to okay. hear it closer than we have ever been. Okay. That's what I was All right. Saying. Okay, okay. And <laughs> advice. Excited, so we're getting there. I Absolutely. Love it. And what about advice yeah. for somebody who wants to follow in your footsteps? You know, here's what I would say. Somebody's watching this and would say, well, I didn't get a chance to be a part of this program. I didn't win this. And by the way, all our filmmakers are getting a, a blind script deal. And what that wow. basically means is that they're getting a chance to be commissioned to write a script sight unseen, right? It's about their voices, not about a specific project. And that is huge. That is like the gold standard of something that you can get in our industry. So they're going to be mentored by folks like me and others. But if you're watching this and you say, you know, I want to get in this industry and I didn't win this competition, I'm not a part of this series, that's okay. Do not give up. It's a tough industry, but you control your own destiny. It's your voice. It's your vision. Your dream is not over, even if you get told no a million times. It's not over until you say it's over. So maintain control of your destiny and do not give up and keep working and working and grinding, and you will be successful. And you got to believe that. You got to make that a self-fulfilling prophecy. I really believe that. Wow. We're all that in. Was, I know. Thank you, motivation. Bro. has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine.
has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Welcome back. Next Monday, May 31st, marks 100 years since the beginning of what's become known as the Tulsa Race Massacre. It was a deadly and coordinated attack on an African-American neighborhood. It is a story that for decades was swept under the rug out of shame and fear. NBC's Harry Smith joins us with more. Hey, Harry, good morning. It's hard to imagine a neighborhood like Greenwood in Tulsa, right? A place that was so financially self-sufficient it was thought that Booker T. Washington called it the Black Wall Street. Wow. Money in this neighborhood would exchange 12 times before it came back out again. Mm -hmm. What happened there was so heinous, so racist, that it was really literally swept under the rug and well hidden for decades. Hard to comprehend what happened there, unless, of course, you lived it. On June 1st, 1921, nine-year-old Eldoris McCondici was awakened by her mother. What her mother said next, she never forgot. She says, we have to go out, get out. I said, she says, the, the white people are killing the colored people. Eldoris grew up in the Greenwood area of Tulsa, a buoyant, bustling community of some 10,000 African Americans. There were schools, churches, stores, theaters, and a hospital. It was a place where, for African Americans, the American dream was working. Scott Ellsworth is a Tulsa native. He's been searching for the truth of what happened here most of his life, reporting his findings in a new book, The Groundbreaking. Something happens in an elevator in an office building in downtown Tulsa between a 19-year-old shoe shiner who's African American named Dick Rowland and a 17-year-old white elevator operator named Sarah Page. A scream from Page leads to Roland's arrest the next day. By that evening, a lynch mob gathered outside the courthouse where Roland was jailed. The hours go by, the lynch mob is 100, 200, 500, 800 people going. Word gets to Greenwood and a group of black World War I veterans show up to help the sheriff defend Roland. They're turned away. As they are leaving, an elderly white man went up to a tall black vet and said, where are you going with that gun? A tussle ensues, a shot goes off, and uh, the massacre begins. The veterans retreat to Greenwood with the mob in pursuit. Gun battles erupt, but somehow it is quiet overnight until the next morning. All of a sudden, there's a, a whistle that goes off, and at that point, this white mob starts walking towards Greenwood. Eldoris and her family flee, running north up a set of railroad tracks. The crowd was just the whole breadth of the railroad track, on the sides and down the middle. The residents of Greenwood try to defend their neighborhood, but they don't have a chance. The National Guard sprays the residents with machine gun fire, and it gets worse. You have something new up in the air, and its airplanes start flying over Greenwood. There is evidence, and I believe this firmly, that at least on one of the airplanes, uh, a co-pilot is dropping sticks of dynamite down on Greenwood. The airplane was up, just raining down the bullets, and I could see them, and I heard them, and I was so frightened. Greenwood is left a smoldering ruin. 9,000 people left homeless. The dead uncounted. Estimates range from 75 to 300. Eldoras lived until 2010. Her granddaughter, Joy McCondici, keeps her story alive. What did Tulsa lose by having that entire neighborhood destroyed? The glory of the bright city shining on the hill. Eldoris and other survivors gave testimony to the Tulsa Race Riot Commission, a commission that ultimately recommended reparations for the survivors. The state had a great opportunity and they turned it down. Instead, they gave each survivor a gold-plated medal. A sorry substitute for the enormous loss. Why should the sins of the father be visited upon the son? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I tell you why, because the, the, the wealth of the father went along with the sins of the father, and that wealth was visited upon the son. A lingering question is where the victims were buried. The commission identified three potential mass grave sites. One has yielded a dozen caskets, but there's another site never filmed before that has Scott's attention, near a homeless encampment above the Arkansas River. In 2002, a retired Tulsa police officer named Bob Patty told us about being shown a photograph showing a trench with bodies in it. You could see a steam shovel behind it. So it's our supposition that it's here. And the homeless are very much convinced that there is something evil in the canes right there. Kevin Ross is chairman of the Mass Graves investigation. Do you feel like Tulsa has come to grips with this very dark day 100 years ago? I wouldn't say grip. I think Tulsa has come to make that first step. Joy McCondichie will be taking her own steps to come to terms with the past, organizing a century walk for June 1st, retracing the same route her grandmother took some 100 years ago. We're going to walk a mile in their shoes as they escaped on this Midland Valley Railroad track. That's the only way I think I can um, make my grandmother proud. Those thousands that escaped off those railroad tracks were then put in the equivalent of, of internment camps for some time before they were let go again. Well, what this, a, please, go ahead. There's a million questions uh, well, and I have a million I just, answers. What about the, the people there now, Harry? I mean, I, you know, I know in the, in the years after. There's a tiny little piece yeah. of that neighborhood left, a couple, a block and a half maybe, on two sides of the street. And the other side is was almost all flattened, right? There's a giant branch campus of Oklahoma State University there, mm -hmm. right? And otherwise, a lot of open territory. It's, um, you know, it's a, there's so many sins, yeah. right, that we have committed as white Americans against our black brethren. But as they go, this is as bad as it gets. Well, and it's multi-generational mm -hmm. impact. Right. It just goes on and on. When you mm -hmm. talk about a neighborhood that had so much Pro just promise for her to say that was the shining mm -hmm. city on the mm -hmm. hill yeah. and to have it be destroyed and what that has wrought over the generations. I know so many white Oklahomans who of my age and even, uh, you know, a couple of decades younger, said we never heard about never it. Never heard about it. Never, never knew and about it. And the reparations question is so disheartening. I mean, there was a chance to try to make things a little bit right a and you get a medal. Hand, a yes. tiny handful of survivors, yes. right? Yeah. Here's your medal. Yeah. yeah. All right. Harry, thank, thank you. you. NBC News Now has a documentary, yes. and there's a lot of, of, of documentaries that are out now. Okay. We invite you to go out there, take a look, learn what you need to learn. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything for traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. On the morning of April 20th, 1989, New York City awakened to the horrifying news. A Wall Street investment bank left for dead after a brutal attack while she was jogging in Central Park. A female jogger was clinging to life after being beaten and sexually assaulted in Central Park. The city was outraged. The police quickly arrested a group of teenagers, among them Yusuf Salam, 
Their trial gripped the city, their conviction seen by many at the time as justice served. Arrested at 15, you spend seven years in, in prison for a crime you did not commit, vilified in the public for years. But the title of the book is better, not bitter. Not even just a smidge of bitterness. I gotta tell you, I found out that a thing like forgiveness, as, as, as an example of where we can go with being able to get out of being bitter, forgiveness is for you. It's for you to be able to surgically cut yourself from the ball and chain that is holding you back. At the beginning of the book, you, you talk about seeing the hand of God in everything yes. that happened to you. Absolutely. What do you, you mean by that? There's absolutely no way to get through any trial unless you can see the positive outlook on things. I want people to understand that it is through these kinds of trials that when you're tested, then you can testify. You have a testimony because you were able to grow through something as opposed to just go through something. You think part of your purpose in life was, was going to prison for a crime you didn't commit? Absolutely. I, you know, it's one of those questions where you say to yourself, if I had an opportunity to change anything, would I? But if you change anything in your past, you change everything in your future. So you do it again. You, you take the fall for a crime you didn't commit. And I wouldn't necessarily say that. Okay, <laughs> okay. Salam served nearly seven years in prison. In 2002, the convictions of the Central Park Five were vacated after a serial rapist confessed to the crime. After you were exonerated, did you still feel vilified or did oh you feel gosh. you still? Absolutely. I came out of prison in so I'm 6'3, and I'm still walking around with my head down inside because it's still not popular to say, yes, I'm one of the Central Park Five. Why are we here? Central Park Five! Things started changing in 2012 when a documentary about the Central Park Five came out, followed by the Netflix miniseries, When They See Us, in 2019. I don't think we should admit to something that we didn't do. It really wasn't popular in a grand scale until the Central Park Five documentary came out where we got our voices back, and then, when they see us liberated us, we had no idea that we would be rebranded correctly as the Exonerated Five. The fact that his book is coming out during a time of upheaval across the country on the topic of criminal justice is not lost on Salam. Young people, when George Floyd was murdered, they said the system is not broken. It's operating exactly as it was designed. When you were sitting in that prison cell, knowing you had not committed this, this heinous crime. Is this where you thought you would be? Honestly, I, I don't think I thought I would be here. I thought I, would, I thought I would somehow get free and piece my life back together. I didn't know that when God restores what was taken from you, 100 times more than what was taken is what's given. Yusef Salam and the other members of the Central Park Five did receive a multi-million dollar settlement from the city of New York. Salam, now an author, a public speaker, even designs his own jewelry. Uh, the book, Better, Not Bitter, is out today. Uh, and let me tell you, like, that was one of those conversations where you mm. leave mm. inspired. Mm. Like, yeah. you just, you, it's, he, he put a lot of things in perspective. Uh, for me, and I think a lot of folks as well. It's not just talk either, he exudes oh, a lot yes. of grace. Lives it's, it. It's like Lives in every it. cell. Is he, is he married? Does he have a... Yes, yeah. he's, he's married. He's, he's got kids, lives down in Georgia. Right. Uh, you know, somewhat happily ever after to a certain extent, yeah. I guess you could say. But, uh, but yeah, the, the book is solid. If you can pick it up, I'd encourage you to go yeah. out. You found and a real purpose. Real hard yeah. earned happily yeah. ever after. Welcome to Today All Day. All Day? Today All Day. All Day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking, yeah. who's your okay. favorite character you've ever oh, played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. 
Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. My buddy Cal cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Okay. Look at it. Doesn't, it doesn't look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Will you okay. judge us in a cook-off? I yes. will, and okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day. Welcome to Today All Day. The next 30 minutes, you'll be hanging with me, and I have some of my favorite original videos just for you, full of inspiration and hope. So take a seat, get a tissue, come along for the ride as we hear words of wisdom from some of my favorite people. I like to be around people of faith, people filled with joy, people that have big vision. That's one of the gifts you have. You're, you're always, you know, joyful and positive and expressive, and I, I think it's contagious, so I do think that's important. Uh, one of the things I love about my Quoted By series is I get to sit down with people who I admire and hear what their sort of guiding light is. Pastor Joel Osteen is with me now. And Pastor Osteen, you lead, you know, a flock of thousands and thousands of people. So I was thinking, I wonder what quote uh, he will choose for the one that seems to be present to him right now. So what is the quote that you choose today? The quote that I chose is from the, it's from the scripture. It says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. And, you know, it's important to me, Hoda, because I don't think we always realize that our words are setting the direction for our life. And how many times do we speak out negative things, I'll never get any good breaks, I'll never meet the right person, this pandemic's going to ruin my business. I believe we're speaking death into our future. So I think it's important to speak positive and to speak life over yourself, over your family, over your finances. And I don't mean that you, you know, you're pie in the sky, but I believe there's nothing wrong with instead of saying, you know, how you doing? Well, I'm not feeling well. Hey, I'm blessed. I'm mm -hmm. strong. I'm healthy. I think those words should be playing in our spirit and, and, and speak them, at them out as well. You know, it's so funny you say that because I think a lot of people, I, there's, a, there's a quote that says something like, you're the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with, so choose wisely. Isn't it funny how your group can become who you are? Uh, sometimes if you hang around with someone who's negative all the time, all of a sudden you find yourself complaining too. I know, it's so important, you know, you gotta you got pay attention because you kind of draw that in. And, and I think sometimes how it happens gradually and you don't realize it and you become a, you know, a negative or a complainer or jealous or, or just a limited vision. I think that's what's stopping a lot of people today. So I like to be around people of faith, people filled with joy, people that have big vision. That's one of the gifts you have. You're, you're always, you know, joyful and positive and expressive. And I, I think it's contagious. So I do think that's important. Well, that makes me feel good. So you just made me feel good today, Pastor Osteen. Again, I'm just going to read your proverb quote one more time. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. That's Proverbs 1821. Uh, Pastor Osteen, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, Hoda. Great being with you. Oh, you too. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the rebels, 
There is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Do you feel hopeful? I do. Yeah. People have seen, people have changed in their hearts, and they're ready to move forward. So I am hopeful. I, I do see this as a reset button. Welcome to Quoted By. Um, I adore Vanessa Williams, but who doesn't? So I always wondered, like, I feel like who's, someone like Vanessa, I always wondered, like, what would be her guiding light, her North Star when it came to a quote? So, Vanessa, is there something right now that is sort of moving you? Absolutely right now, and I don't want to misquote it. It, it is from... Um, say their names, which, uh, or stand for change, um, AKA what our Black Theater United theme song is. And one of the quotes, which is the second verse is, we can curse the dark or we can light the light. Start with just one spark and burn forever bright. Freedom has its price, justice sacrifice, but our eyes are on the prize. So say their names, kneel down in righteous rage, and when you stand, take a stand for change. And it's all about this reset button now. We're all listening. We're all willing to move forward, be open, and make those changes of inclusion and belonging that have been kind of null and void, but also forgotten. What was the breaking point for you, Vanessa? Where was the point where you said to yourself, that's it, like, I cannot sit here anymore? I, I think uh, witnessing the, the murder of George Floyd, I think we all collectively were at home. Um, and then when I got it on my, my camera, my, my phone, when I first got it, I said, well, this is just gonna be another un unfortunate act of abuse. And then I said, I'm not actually gonna see a death in front of me. And then when I saw it, I was numb for days mm -hmm. as the rest of the world. Um, and that was when, and it was a cumulative effect, obviously with mm -hmm. all the deaths, and it was that turning point where something had to be said. And I'm a, a black woman who had a black father. My brother is black. I raise a black son. And the danger that um, we live in, which is unknowing for a lot of people. I mean, for instance, I live in a, a predominantly white um, neighborhood, uh, affluent as well. But we make sure that the cops know who our sons are, mm -hmm. so they know that this, this is a black child that goes to the schools here and is a resident here. So please make sure that you don't see him as a suspect, but know that he is a community member. And that's the thing that you have to do as a black mother that right. other people wouldn't even think about. Wouldn't even imagine that. And just before we go, do you feel hopeful? I do. Yeah. Um, you know, again, uh, since, you know, starting um, uh, being one of the founding members of Black Theater United, um, we have seen so many people, so many allies ready to work uh, and come up with solutions for inclusion. So people have seen, people have changed in their hearts, and they're ready to move forward. So I am hopeful. I, I do see this as a reset button. Wow. Now, it's not for change. Well, this song, by the way, is a great song. Um, I hope that people uh, check it out. It's called Stand for Change. It's a beautiful song, and I know that you guys are raising uh, money. It's all for a great cause. So, Vanessa, thank you so much. Thank you, Hoda. You're the best. All right, you too. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! 
It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. I just feel like I'm dancing for so many people that weren't given the opportunities that I have, and so I understand my responsibility. I'm so excited because I am sitting next to one of the premier dancers in the country, around the world, Misty Copeland. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm happy to see you too. I think when people see you, they think, wow, I bet you this kid was born and had had everything kind of, not handed to her, but you know, um, had everything top drawer. Let's talk about your quote, because I think this means a lot. Um, your, these, you have two favorites, this is one of them. <laughs> Where you come from doesn't necessarily determine where you're going in life. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think people would assume that someone comes from a privileged background being a part of, you know, such an elite art form. But that's what's so amazing, I think, having the opportunity to be a part of something where you just don't see people like myself being represented in that space. Mm. So it's really exciting when I can go to these communities that are similar to how I was, where I was raised and how I grew up, um, and just to give them an example of what's possible, mm. that you don't have to fit into this mold in order to be whatever it is you want to be. And I've definitely like come from that experience, you know, growing up in a single parent home, one of six children. I was living in a motel when I started dancing. And mm. so it's about what the arts can do for you and how it can enrich a child's life, no matter if they want to go on to be a professional or not. It's just so important, I think. There's a Mr. Rogers quote, and I'm just thinking about it because he's been in the news a lot lately. And he says, for all of us, there's someone who loved us into being. So who who loved you into being? Uh, I have so many like amazing like fairy godmothers <laughs> and um, brown women that have just been incredible mentors to me. Raven Wilkinson, um, who passed away last year, was a black ballerina, the first and only to dance in an all-white company at the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo in the 50s. Prince was such a big part of my <laughs> growth and just discovering who I am as a woman and as an artist, but having representation, whether it be a woman or, you know, a man, I think that just having people that you can see yourself through and knowing mm. that you don't have to follow someone else's journey or path and that it's more, it's more incredible to be an individual. Where does, but um, confidence is something, I don't know if you're born with it or if you get it, like I'm not sure, but for you, like how did you have the moxie um, I feel like everything that happened in my life up until I was 13 years old really prepared me to be a part of the ballet world in some weird way. Yeah. I think that it's it's such a difficult world to be a part yeah. of. I mean, to get to where I am, like you just have to have so much perseverance and will and drive and really love it um, because the work just, it never ends. And so I feel like coming from, you know, just always struggling and fighting, mm -hmm. It was like, if I can get through that, I'm like, the ballet world, I'm like, I'm good, I'm good, I can handle this. So um, I'm so grateful for like everything that I've experienced and that's made me into the person that I am. How many times do little girls come up to you and say, wow? 
It's, I want to be you. That's got to be so yeah. gratifying. I mean, I think because I understand like the bigger picture and that it's not me. It's like what I represent. Even like older black women that come to me and they're mm. just like, you're living what I wish I could have done or like oh, had the opportunity wow. to do. And it's like, I just feel like I'm dancing for so many people that weren't given the opportunities that I have. And so I understand my responsibility and how I'm seen and viewed. So it's so amazing whenever I meet a little girl or like I mentor, I actually had one of my mentees that I've been mentoring for almost like 10 years now. And she's like a woman. She like came over last night and it's just like crazy to watch them grow up. <laughs> I mean, I know it's a privilege to do what you do. And I know it's a privilege to have people look up to you, but is, is it ever a lot on your shoulders to carry I don't people's dreams no, no. I don't see it that way mm. I feel like like it's been such a long journey and I think for a lot of people that don't know the ballet world and kind of just saw me like come into the you know yeah. spotlight or whatever when I was promoted to principal dancer and it's like this has been a long journey of working to get here and I don't feel that it's like been like okay now you're here and you're gonna be a role model it's like right. been very organic uh. Um, I think if anything, whenever I've felt pressure, it's come from probably like outside, like media where yes. a lot of yes. dance, no, not a lot, no dancer is put in a position where people are writing and talking about whether or not you're going to be promoted and they're right. coming and, and critiquing like your first time approaching a massive role like that doesn't happen usually like as a new principal dancer you'll kind of be under the radar until yeah. you get more experience but it was like my first swan lake was like everyone's there like is she gonna fail is it this does she deserve to be promoted i think that okay, was terrifying. the first time that i ever felt that type of like weight um but in terms of just you know, it is what it is. And just being on the stage is doing wow. so much for the next generation. Wow. Your other quote, which I love too, is don't let other people's words define yeah, you. That's a huge one. And again, for like this generation, especially like young people and social media and just mm -hmm. like, you know, cyber bullying and, and it's people's words can be so powerful and impacting like your emotions and yes. your confidence. And so I just often, I have to remind myself, but I often like yeah. have, am saying to these young kids that like these people that you don't know, like their words shouldn't impact you. You know, yeah. it's the people that care about you yeah. that are supporting you. So it's just like to think simply about it when you get caught up in like what people might say about you. Do you, I mean, I try not to pay attention when stuff yeah. happens, yeah. but I'm <laughs> also a human being. Right, exactly. And sometimes I'll look and I'll get an ouch. Do you like have a suit of armor on? Like how do you um, stop it? I don't look. Of course there are things that happen when like it just comes into your yeah. sphere and you can't avoid it. In master class, which mm -hmm. is coming out, which mm -hmm. I'm so excited about. I definitely share a lot of those stories that I think are just as important as like learning about the technique of, of classical ballet, but as any athlete would know, it's mm. about your emotional state. Yes. It's about, you know, taking care and like just being strong and being confident because we're human beings and yes. we're not often looked, you know, you're on stage and so people just kind of were like, all right, you have to be perfect every time right. like I come to see you. Yeah. Um, but I definitely have had situations where people have you know you're not supposed to film things in the theater where yeah. people have filmed me and like posted it on youtube and you know just horrible things like misty copeland failing and it's and for me i try and if i do see it and i think that it's an important topic to cover i post it actually oh, this you do. horrible video of me on all of my social platforms and just started this topic of yeah, conversation wow. about bullying and what you can learn from seeing wow. those things and that you don't always have to address it yeah but i think it's important to let's talk about the nutcracker you're back so excited what made you decide well so the nutcracker yeah. is like a part of every ballet dancer's world like that's you know I, lo I personally love it and mm -hmm. the version that American Ballet Theater does um, is not the traditional choreography. Mm -hmm. It's like a lot more like kind of whimsical mm. and contemporary. Um, but most dancers would be like, oh my God, Nutcracker. Like, 
<laughs> you know, you do it every year, yeah, but yeah. it's the type of ballet that can bring people in from mm. all types, different backgrounds that, you know, it's just such a part of, especially in America, like the holiday tradition. And then having been in the Nutcracker in the Four Realms, the Disney movie that came out, it's just incredible to be a brown ballerina and be put in a position to represent ballet, like in a Disney film. And I think that it's huge for, you know, just the future of ballet. Are you happy? I'm like, no, I'm miserable. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sometimes you never know. Yeah. Oh my God, so <laughs> you are traveling all over the world. Yeah. You're holding it together. You have a great life. You're a shining role model. And um, I'm just happy I got to sit with you Thank for a few you. minutes. Thank you, Misty. Thank you. Thanks happy. for having me. Mm, don't move. Mm. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. What's meant to be will be, and it will always come at the right time, and so you just have to believe that. Okay, it's my Quoted By series, and I know you love her. If you listen to country music like I do, she's a go-to on the country music uh, circuit. Her name is Carly Pierce. Carly, it's great to see you. How are you? So good to see you. I'm great. Whenever I see someone like you who's a bright light, I always wonder, is there, do they have some kind of guiding quote? Something they look at and say, yeah, like this is, this is kind of my guiding light. What is your, what is your favorite quote? Right now, in this season in my life, um, I've really leaned into what's meant to be will always find a way. Mm. And why do you say as you lean into this season in your life, why, is, why does that, is that poignant for you right now? The past year and a half, I've had a lot of changes. And I think that in my personal life and in my, my professional life, my producer died of brain cancer. Um, I went through a public divorce. And I think that in those moments, you have to just truly lean into your faith, and I'm a believer in God, and I genuinely believe that He works all things for our good, and what's meant to be will be, and it will always come at the right time, and so you just have to believe that. I think a lot of people feel you. They may be going through something similar. They have that feeling of being on their knees and wonder, like, when will this storm pass? And I think, like all storms, they do eventually. You know, when you get up in the morning, is there something that you do that sort of readjusts you to get you set so you can tackle another day? I have two things that I pretty much do every day. I am very into just starting my day with Bible study. So I'll do a devotional or I'll just read a scripture that kind of sets the intention for the day. I feel like that always gets my mind right. And I'm a big runner, so I gotta, I gotta go run it out. Run it out and sweat it out. <laughs> well, Carly, you're a delight. Um, you are such a bright light. And um, I know that you're going through, you've been going through a lot. And I'm just happy that, you've, that you you came and joined us today. And I think a lot of people will nod their heads and say, me too. Um, and it's good to Aww. see you like that. Thank you, Carly. We can't wait till you come to the studio and sing for me us either. again. We're waiting, okay? <laughs> Yes, I'll be there. All right, Carly, thanks. If there's anybody who I think picks amazing quotes, either from your books or just when you come in the makeup room and you're like, oh my God, I've got one, <laughs> it's you. So when I was trying to figure out what is 
your quote of quotes. Mm -hmm. I was dying to know what it was. One of the things I love is a good quote. Words of wisdom, of comfort, encouragement, words of inspiration, just small reminders to forge ahead or maybe to take a step back and reflect. A thought to keep life in perspective. So, what gets you through your day? This is the one you chose. Will you read it for us? Yes, this is the one I chose. What lies behind us and what lies before us are small matters compared to what lies within us. And um, I love this mm -hmm. because I think so many of us spend time worried or afraid of what's mm -hmm. coming or what's going to happen and will we survive this or that or the other. And when I saw this quote by Emerson, it gave me a sense of relief. It made me feel like, okay, no matter what I've been through or what I'm going to go through, I can handle it because what's within me mm -hmm. is way bigger than whatever's happened to me or whatever's coming at me. And trying to get to that point in life yeah. doesn't come easy. I mean, when you think about your life mm -hmm. and you think about times where you've been sweating, oh my gosh, am I gonna get the job? Am I going to make this work? You know, are my kids yeah, gonna be the okay? The list goes on. Whatever it is, right. Yeah. So how do you come to this kind of feeling, I guess? Well, I think you have to go through some stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think we spend the way too much of our time thinking we can't handle whatever's going to happen to us. Mm -hmm. We're afraid. I think fear is such a paralyzer. Yeah. Like, I won't be able to handle that. I won't right. be able to handle whatever that is. And then this just kind of discovering this quote, everything is small compared to what lies within us. And trying to find that power inside, because I think we don't think enough of ourselves. I don't think well, we sure. think that. Well, sure, we're constantly yeah. being told we're not enough of this, yes. not enough of that, right. we're not smart enough, good enough, yeah. pretty enough, thin <laughs> enough, and no wonder we think that whatever life is gonna throw at us is gonna knock us down. But I think if anybody really absorbs this quote mm -hmm. and believes it, mm -hmm. understands that whatever we've been through and whatever you're going to go through, right. It's small compared right. to the strength that's in you. Well, what is that thing, do you think, that's inside of us? Uh, well, I look at it as divinity. I believe that all of us are, are divine. All of us are special. All of us are created for a purpose and for a calling and for a mission. And that we wouldn't be here mm -hmm. if that were not the case. And that everything we need is here. It's not in the shoes we buy. It's not in the job we get. And I think you realize that when you get fired or, yeah. you know, a parent passes away or you lose a marriage or you lose a friend and you think like, how will I survive that? And then you do and you, you notch up a couple of survival yeah, skills right. and then you're like, wow, what's in me? I can handle mm -hmm. what's going to come. You lost parents, a marriage, things like that. Did you doubt Oh, Did yeah. you doubt that you'd make oh, it? Oh, yeah. Right? I, I spent uh, my whole life, my mother was sick kind of while I was, when I was young, all through my life, and I always thought and felt I would never survive hmm. without my mother. I couldn't even imagine my life without my mother. It's not like I like it or it was easy, but I've survived. At the end of my marriage, I thought, I can't survive, but I'm sitting here, right? I didn't think I could survive my kids leaving home or going off. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like it, but I've survived. Mm -hmm. And so I think liking it and surviving right. are two different things. Right. I think we all beat ourselves up right. so much throughout our lives and in our lives. And what I like also about mm -hmm. this quote is that you know, what's in there is so amazing, mm -hmm. so inspirational. Mm -hmm. We attribute it often to others yeah. and not to ourselves. Uh, how so? like, well, we say like, oh, look at her. She got through this, she got through that. Yeah. Or people look at you and think, oh my God, she survived this and she did that and she's gone. Well, I could never be like that. Well, you are like that. Yeah. You know, you are. I think that's true about comparing ourselves to other people because it right. can be on a, on a big level like what you're describing or it could be on something small. Like, oh my gosh, she's so much better than me. She looks so much better than I do. And yeah. even all those stupid little things. They but, add up. Yeah. And then you go home at the end of the day and you think to yourself, like, oh my gosh, like, what, what am I? And I think not comparing your life, yourself, wow. to somebody else. That's big. The less time you spend trying to be perfect, the less time you spend comparing. And I think kind of embracing what it is, yeah. is makes your life better. 
You came to a lot of this wisdom, these conclusions, because you went through things. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I haven't been through any of your stuff, but I but wonder- you've been through your own stuff, and yeah. I haven't been through your stuff. Okay, but can I get your lessons by reading them? Like, I always wonder, do I need to actually do the thing to feel I hope you thing? don't have to do <laughs> some of the things that I've done, no. As I say to my kids, yeah. don't think stuff's not gonna happen to you. It happens to everybody. Right, it's right. just gonna happen no matter how freaking perfect you think you are, it's gonna yeah, happen. Right. So like, build your internal fortitude, get you know some faith in yourself, surround yourself with people, and you'll pass through. So I right. think everybody goes through something. Mm -hmm. I wonder, could I go through what you went through? Mm -hmm. Could I deal with what you deal with, mm -hmm. right? So I think everybody has different stuff. All right, so if you were gonna give advice, someone's reading this quote, and they want to live this life like they nod their heads yes but they feel like they're missing something just last thing trying well to i don't know this. what they're missing because yeah. what this quote says is that anything you think you're missing you're wrong it's within you mm -hmm. anything you're attributing to anybody else it's within you you don't have to be afraid of failing you don't have to be afraid of your dreams you don't have to be afraid of you know telling that guy you're going out with who's not respecting you to beat it mm -hmm. because you've got what you need and to believe in yourself, you can call that faith in yourself, you can call that faith in a higher power, but you've got it. And the sooner you know that in your life, I think the more wild and free and authentic your life will be. Thank you, Maria. Hi, Today All Day. We've got a great show for you on this Monday morning, including an all-day exclusive chat you can only see here. But let's kick it off with Talking Tokyo. Savannah, Hoda, and Craig join us from the Olympic host city to break down all the big moments that have the world talking. Check it out. Now to uh, something new, something that we're calling Talking Tokyo. It's all about the Olympic moments that have the world talking. And in a few moments, we'll also explain why we're wearing these vests. Well, they, yeah. aside from they're very cute on cute. you. Uh, mm -hmm. First up, legendary gymnast Oksana Chesovitana, the 46-year-old athlete, stuck her final landing yesterday at the women's vault qualifications. Watch that. Wow. Chesovitana ending her Olympic career oh. as the oldest women's gymnast in games history. Representing Uzbekistan this time around, she has participated in every Olympics Damn. since 1992. Wow. At yesterday's event, she received a standing oh. ovation wow. after her scores showed that she would not be advancing any further here mm. in Tokyo. Even in a nearly empty arena, everybody from her competitors to her coaches and even the judges got up to applaud oh. her. She is iconic. She has said that this eighth appearance at the Olympics would be her final one. And so we wish her a big congratulations this morning. What an accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. I amazing. mean, incredible. That is really incredible. All right, guys, coming up, we are at peak summer here in Tokyo. Temps in the 90s, a lot of humidity. Basically, we're saying it's kind of hot here. And we've been noticing that out on the streets, there are three ways that people keep cool. One is the traditional paper fan. In fact, we created Old some school. Today's Show fans. That's oh, that's nice. cute. They have nice. some real pretty, you know, traditional ones, and then we made That's these. cute. Remind, Mine, well, what hang these on, let's do, oh, you do? Yeah, the Tsutsugi. What's it called? Hmm? A Sugi. So you should not just jet no. a Sugi. A Sugi. Yeah. Okay. You said it, I believe it. All right, this is what the kids are using. It's just a little, like a, I don't know. People do walk it's around like a Beyonce, Beyonce you fan. You just walk around. Yeah, yeah. so you have it's Beyonce. Cool. All right. All right, so, but if you really, really want to keep cool, you got to look at uh, Al and Craig. They've got something called a fan vest. I can hear yours, Roker. Yeah. It's can you glowing. demo it? So what is yeah, Al's So there's a little control there. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you slide that in the pocket in the front. There's a fan going. Look at, look at. Two fans. Look right here. Two fans. But where is it? Where it's right is it there. It's on, where the, is it it's on the tush. Right there. But right where there. is it? It fans your inside? Yeah, fans your fanny. How does it feel? It fans your fanny? Exactly. It's vibrating. All right. Well, do you like it? Uh, well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's way too jet lagged to go well, down that well. road. Okay. Just We're gonna take these back to one A. Take these back to one A. All right, kids. All right. That was cute. Up next on Today Talks, the third hour gang checks in with a special guest to break down all things Olympics. I'll give you a hint, okay? He loves wearing khakis. Any guesses? We're gonna see who he is after this. Fire. 
and good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So, it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Welcome back. Today in the third hour, the gang checks in with everyone's favorite khaki-wearing political correspondent, Steve Kornacki, to break down all things Olympics. Check it out. We know him. We love him. We can't live without him. We're keeping up with Kornacki. Steve, you brought the big board to the big game. I can't believe we got this thing on the plate. I had to buy the extra seat, but here we go. <laughs> so what do you got for us? So let's take a look here. You, know, you were just talking a few segments ago there to the first ever bronze medal winner in men's skateboarding. It's yeah. one of four new events debuting here at the Summer Olympics. There's skateboarding. There's surfing. There's karate, mm. there's sport climbing. Sport you, climbing. Sport climbing. You might, it's, it's kind of wall climbing. It's okay. rock climbing. What it is, it is the ultimate test, the triathlon of climbing, if you will. It's three events, really. It's speed climbing, lead climbing, and bouldering. Wow. So you do those three, and that's what goes into climbing. And I think all three, all four of these, I probably broke a bone at some point as a kid trying to <laughs> do. Right. So those are the new sports. Let's talk about one of the fan favorites, gymnastics. Tomorrow, of course, the women's team final for gymnastics. What can you tell us about this, this event in particular? Yeah, so, I mean, take a look here. For, for women in team gymnastics, it's four apparatus that they're basically dealing with here. It's the beam. It's the bars. It's the vault. It's the floor. I was hoping we'd get a nice little graphic here. Ah, there, there we go. Okay. Right. So we've got four gymnasts here that make up Team USA for the team competition. And you've got those four events. As I say, it's the beam, it's the bars, it's the floor, it's the vault. And the, the challenge here for Team USA is they got to pick what they think are their top three mm -hmm. for each event when uh. they go through the team runs. So there's a lot of strategy involved there. And there's a streak on the line here for Team USA in this women's event, this women's team gymnastics event. They won the gold in 2012. They won the gold in 2016. They're going for their third straight gold. Uh -huh. It's been an, a modern era of dominance here for the U.S. women when it comes to this. They are trying to become, you could see it here. Yeah. In the old days, it was the Soviet Union. Right. In the old days, it was Romania. The U.S. was lucky to get any kind of a medal. The last generation, the U.S. has the most gold medals in this sport. It has the most overall medals going for three straight mm -hmm. here. But there is some suspense because in the qualifying yeah. round on yeah. Sunday, yeah. Finish, first time the U.S. did not come in first in anything in a decade. So they got to turn that around on Tuesday night to keep that streak alive. Let's bring Chanel Jones in. She's got a question. Steve, uh, it's uh, Chanel and Jacob here from New York City. Uh, another female, we all watched it the other night, who dominates is swimmer Katie Ledecky. What should we know about Katie? So Katie Ledecky has a chance to do, we're mentioning new sports at this Olympics. There's a new event within a sport at these Olympics. And Katie Ledecky is going to take a shot at this, the 1,500-meter women's it's freestyle. Really so they, Yeah, and she did it. 1,500 meters in the pool. She did that 15 minutes, 20 seconds, 48 uh, hundredths of a second there. That's the world record. But you know why I know Katie Ledecky is favored in this event? Why? Mm -hmm. Because we went back and we looked the top 10 times in the history of this event yeah. are all held by Katie Ledecky. <laughs> okay. So I think right. that makes her the okay. odds-on favorite okay. going into this. She's going to have to beat her own record. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Hey, Steve, Steve knows this already because I talked to Steve earlier this morning. I was I'm inspired by the pullover, so I took off my suit. I put on my own too tight Olympics uh, shirt. Yours look, it fits very perfectly, and you look great. I want to register it. I heard, Steve, you have a little guessing game for us, athlete versus. What is this? Bring it on. <laughs> yeah, so let, let's. Uh, you mentioned Katie Ledecky here, athlete versus. So let's okay. compare the skills and the, the uh, capability here of a great athlete with the Empire <laughs> State Building. Here's what I'm asking you. A little okay. challenge. Okay. Here's some going to test your uh, intuition on this. Okay. What is a greater distance? The 1,500 oh, meters wow. that Katie Ledecky is going to have to swim in right. that new event or 
the distance from the ground to the very top of the Empire State Building. Which do you what think you Katie is Ledecky. a bigger distance? You say, you say, I say Ledecky. Ledecky. You say there's 15. What do you guys say back in New York? What do you think? Empire State Building. Okay, I'm going with Jacob. Empire State Building. I'm going to take Roker. I'm gonna, we're going to go with Ledecky here in Tokyo. All right. Well, the winner of this little competition, yes. it's Roker and Melvin. Uh, because yes. it is. That's why we're talking about them. 1,500 meters, 443 <laughs> meters from the bottom to the top. Wow. It's three Empire That's State insane. Building and change. The three and change. That's crazy. Is swimming. Crazy. And uh, also, every every mascot uh, or Olympics since the since the 1996 Games has had a mascot. How many Today Show mascots are there? I believe that in the entire history of the Today Show, there is now one. Yes, Two. there is. Yeah. That's right. And you can go <laughs> to the Today uh, to Today.com and help name our new mascot. It really is. Here's the thing. I don't throw this adjective around a lot. Adorable. Adorable. Yes. Adorable. Also adorable. adorable. Chanel Jones. Adorable. Aren't you kind? Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, all the latest from Tokyo after this. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. been a long year yeah where it's been anything but normal well now there's hope the covid vaccines i know i know it's been a little confusing like really confusing so it's more important than ever to make a plan visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine what are you waiting for roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine plan your vaccine plan your vaccine with someone who's at the center of all the action, Hoda. Check it out. Girl, first I want to say thank you. I'm wearing your shirt, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Secondly, okay, I got to tell you something. A 14-hour flight, it's, uh, it's something so weird. I thought I would be totally out of it. You know who has crazy eyes? Roker. Roker's <laughs> eyes are crazy. You know how you get when you're done? Like, I'm scared he's going to blurt something out, and it'll be his last day. Well, also, he but was drinking God, sake yeah. on, the sh on the show. Too I know. much sake can lead to some, you know, who, who knows what comes out of his mouth. Well, fatigue and him being a boozer, not a good combination. <laughs> but I, I have to tell you, Jenna, we, we're missing you here because, you know, you're our partner and our compadre. But I was just so shocked at like how this, how much it feels like an Olympic Games. You know, you hear all this stuff about, oh, you know, there's no fans and it's this and it's that. I have to tell you, Jenna, like the Today Show set is right, right next to me. Mm -hmm. All these athletes were streaming in. They had that sparkly look in their eye. They're wearing the hardware. I was like, oh my God, you did it. Like you did it. And they like, they have the look that only an Olympian can have. So it's been super cool. And you have the look that only a Hoda mama could have because you love the <laughs> Olympics more than anybody. But is it true? that Haley snuck one of her first of all you always have some weird piece of clothing in your bag so it did not surprise me at totally all totally weird but did Haley totally put in weird. a star dress in your in your bag 
by the way, it was so funny. So I was looking through my suitcase and she packed <laughs> things that she thought I might need. Dresses. She said, are you going to wear them? One was her star dress, which was so cute. She actually Aww. packed three of her dresses in my luggage, a pair of cat socks. I thought Bernadette <laughs> would like that. And, and a pair of her PJs. So I have like a whole Haley wardrobe that's there. And, you know, she's adorable. Like, you know, she's you know, hilarious. like night, night six, you're going to be smelling that. You're going to be like, hey, <laughs> smells like draft. Exactly. Mm. And she also <laughs> hacked your Instagram. Is that tr she really posted herself? By the no, let me tell you. Some let me tell you something. She was like, Mom, say congratulations, USA. She had my phone. And I was like, congratulations, USA. And I heard her go, congratulations, USA. And she goes, I'm going to post it on Insta. Well, she don't know Insta. She's four. <laughs> so I was like, ha, ha, ha. I get to the airport, Jenna. I'm literally, there's Laura and Mary, and we're standing there. And she goes, your, your daughter's so cute on Insta. I go, what? She goes, she, her, her post about, I look. She, had she figured out how to, boop, post it. So now, now we're Mama's going to have to crack down on the phone yeah, usage. We're going to have to leave. Congratulations, USA. Congratulations, What was USA. that? I don't know, but I feel like you have to make that your ringtone. It's the cute, that, like, that. what a way to work, wake up. She gets her cheerleading from her mama. Okay, Huda, yeah. you have a list. This right. cracked me up because it's not your top three favorite things. It's your top five favorite things. You've been there 24 hours, but Too what are things. they, baby? What are they? Okay, okay so here we go. First of all, uh, Savannah, uh, Al, Craig, and I went up to the top of this really, really tall tower, the tallest tower in the entire world. You hate stuff it's like that. It's called the Co Tokyo Sky Tree. Hate. Hated. Hated. Okay? I'm just letting you know. But it was totally... The weird thing was you could actually see all of Tokyo. If, and then and then we went down the elevator. So that was cool. Okay, so that was my first, my number, my number one. And probably, Jenna, to be honest, it's because it's the only thing we did because we just got here. <laughs> That's why when they told me that you have five favorite things already, I'm like, that you were so like, Hoda. She's been there she six minutes and she has five Top five favorite things. Okay, next. I watched this too. I loved this. There's a fencer oh. named Lee who made history. Talk mm. about her. Oh my God. Okay, so Lee Keeper's a fencer. She won an, uh, our first US individual gold in foil. It's called individual foil. So she happens to be married to a member of the US men's facing team. His name is Garrick. And so they both came on the set and Lee was there with her proud husband, and this kind of melted us, so take a look. He actually said his proudest moment was you winning gold. It's gonna make me cry. What, <laughs> what did that mean to you? Oh, it means everything. We've been chipping away at this for a decade. We've been together for a decade, married two years, and it's our dream to be here together. She yeah. made my Olympic dream come true. Being able to see her go out and fight her nerves and, and come out with the gold medal was, was really something really special. Mm. One down. Okay, one now down. we're all oh. crying. Yes. <laughs> wow. <sighs> you can't do that to me. <laughs> That's the sweetest. <laughs> Wait, his Olympic dream came true. His dream is her I mean, dream. It's the best. Oh, so sweet. Okay. I know. <laughs> Swimming, everybody's talking about it. Katie Ledecky, talk about what's going on. I also love that yeah. coach, that Australian coach dance yes. number. Yes. Right? That's the one. I, I mean, that. Katie Ledecky, she was just eked out. It was an, uh, the Australian, uh, her last name is Titus Beater, by, it's like a hair. Mm -hmm. But I think. The big, the big moment came when her coach yes. saw this win for Katie Ledecky, and people were saying he moved like Jagger. Take a look. Looks sort of like Doc Brown. <laughs> I mean, he is going crazy. <laughs> I, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh He's my like God. putting on a show like Cra Mick Jagger Cray. or the Rolling Stones or something. That yeah, that little move where he kind of like, I don't know, thrusted his hips. Who are you smiling at? Are you paying attention to me? What's going well, on there? Yosef's here. No, I am. OK, I'll <laughs> tell you what's happening. Yosef's here and then it started raining. So I'm trying to be cash because I got to keep my hair for gymnastics. <laughs> So I'm trying to, I was, I was very concerned about weather sensitive hair exploding, but I'm not going to be a baby about hair. Who cares? Let's talk about my next favorite moment, the Today Show mascot. Yes. Okay. 
This right here, we're widening out. Okay, this is the Today Show oh, mascot. So sweet. She happens to be, I don't know, a Fulbright scholar or a Rhodes scholar. She's one of our, our crack <laughs> researchers. She's under here. Can you believe it? But anyway, this is our Today Show mascot. We have to think of a name for the Today Show mascot. So they have a whole bunch of choices. What do you, what's so your cute. favorite? Do you have any? Do, can, I don't remember how to pronounce any of them, they, but they're do they all talk? good. No, no, no. No, you can't talk. It's just like, mm -hmm. no, you can't. But what name would you like, Jenna? Um, I think whatever the one that means sunrise, I think is sweet. The, which one means sunrise? I can't. Kino de. Kino de. Kino de. Yes. Kino de. That's it's Malia. One. This is Malia. Hold on. Uh, oh, Malia, Malia happy is birthday. helping us. It's her birthday. Happy I know. Birthday. Malia celebrated her birthday. He no day. He no Our day. girl Malia, she left. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, well, we I love, love you. You can take it off and breathe. Yes. She's about to, Phoebe's about to faint. Okay? Phoebe's like, thanks a lot now. for bye signing bye, me Phoebe's. up for this job. Bye bye. Um, okay, you've got to show She's me the like, view. Uh, I think your, fa your fifth oh, the, favorite the thing last. is the view. Yeah. Look at this. Jenna. <gasps> Jenna. Gorgeous. Look. This is Tokyo Bay. This is the, these are the Olympic rings. This is the view from every balcony. It's gorgeous. It is a beautiful country. The people are kind hearted. Mm. They, they keep asking us, do you like it here? Do you like it here? I'm like, we love it here. It's a beautiful host city. It's under unfortunate circumstances, but they are making the most of it. We feel embraced and loved and we're cheering our athletes on, oh. girl. You know what's so much fun too, Hoda? We had a huge mm. crowd here this morning, which was just such fun to see people on the plaza again. Chanel is actually out there right now. There she is. Some stuck around. These hey, folks, yeah, girl. they wanted to stick around. I have to tell you, we've met folks from all around the country this morning. It feels so good to be back out in the plaza. And Hoda, we have a question from Susie. She's from Austin, Texas. Okay. Hi, friend. Good morning. Hoda, you just traveled halfway around the world. My, I'm curious, for Jenna and Hoda, okay. what is something that you cannot travel without? Ooh, good question. Good question. Something I cannot travel without. Um, I always travel with a ton of face cream and all that stuff because I feel like I'm like a dry crusted potato chip when you fly <laughs> for that long. But I realize that the thing I can't live without now is having something of my daughters. Like they, they made me little things like a little, you know, the dress and little pictures. So I love that stuff. I mean, the rest of it you can get. And I really need some anti-humidity spray, okay? Because <laughs> here it's explosion fill. Well, it looks good to us. Susie, Jenna, thank you so much for your you question. Know. Thank you. Bye, Susie. Bye, Susie. Say bye to everybody. Bye, Susie. Hey, for me, please. Love you, Jenna. Love you, Hoda. Okay, go get some sleep. Bye, guys. Go get some sleep. We'll see you okay, again tomorrow. Okay, nighty night. Love you. Night night. <laughs> It is time for Unscripted. Um, okay, first of all, can we just point out that I am wearing stars? And <laughs> Chanel, will you show them your stripes? Here's the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is Jenna, Savannah, Hoda, Carson Daly. I work with the tallest people on the planet, <laughs> and I'm 4'11". So when I found out I was working with <laughs> Jenna today, I pulled out my July 4th shoes. I've only worn these on July 4th and Memorial Day. And they got a heel. And today. But also, nobody can say we don't commit to a theme, okay? <laughs> so We true. are all in. That's true. Um, okay, you've just caught back from vacation and the I first did. thing we said to each other this so morning. So I just confided to Jenna. So this is the, this is why I guess it's called unscripted because this was not my plan. To we, share just this story. we just go. We just So I was talk. feeling a little flustered this morning. So I have this like spray mist that's supposed to make you feel like revitalized and refreshed. So I was like, I need a lot of spray loose. So I walked into my dressing room this morning and I took the mist and I'm just spraying all over my face. And all of a sudden it was like dripping. And I'm like, what kind of, and I opened my eyes and it was my hair oil. <laughs> and I put it all over my face, like dripping. At so then I took a paper like towel, hand but I'm already breaking out from it because it's like, it was a lot. At least it wasn't something that burned your eyes, <laughs> the mace. Because my eyes were closed. Well, I feel like as, <laughs> you know, we've been with kids and back with yeah. work and this week in the New York Times just published an article that I think maybe you could relate to okay. since you're spraying oil on your face. It's an article that said the case for scheduling everything. Mm. And so that now that life is back to normal, we have, you know, work and everything and we're going, we're saying yes to things. So there's no me time. And that's, that's why you're exhausted and that's you spray true. yourself. Because even if you're on vacation, I was on vacation, you're still trying to make sure everybody else is having fun. We have family in town, yes. right? You're trying to do so much. So Al gave Dylan and I a book for the holidays and it was called, not the art of doing nothing, but it was something like that. Like yeah. the art of not working or something like that. <laughs> 
Absolutely. <laughs> and so I tried to sit down the other day and like start reading it because he said that he's noticed that even when we're not working, we're working. Yes. So it's funny because I did try with intention to read that book and I've tried to say, okay, Fridays, I'm not going to put anything on my calendar. Yes. Like, let's keep Friday Friday open. family night too. But yes. you know what somebody told me when I first had kids and what? it's the best advice and I'm sure you feel this, although yours are getting a little older, what? like family vacation is not a vacation for it's the mother. So You're true. exhausted. It's like, and especially now, like the kids in the pool and the yeah. flips. I'm like, no flips. <laughs> but, you know, but I do think the scheduling part maybe could help, right? Let's scheduling schedule me some time. me time. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm going to do with my, my me time? What are you going to do? Ted Lasso. <laughs> I love him. I saw the clip on Instagram the other day. They have a great Instagram page, by the way, if you haven't seen her. Yeah. Do you know we actually are on, we're on, um, are you on TikTok, TikTok now? I know. I just need to join TikTok I so do, I can let, watch you on TikTok. Do you want to do TikTok with me later? It sounds complicated, but sure. Okay. It sounds like that's a yes. Today Talks continues after the break with an exclusive chat you can only see here on Today All Day. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them, doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Welcome back to Today Talks and the exclusive content you can only see here on Today All Day. Looky who is sitting in this chair. Why, hello. Now, do you, have you ever done a Today All Day chat, to Today so Talks? What are we, we going to do? <laughs> okay. Like, we've got these beautiful chairs. I, I mean, know. This is, fancy. this is the exclusive content you I can only it. see here. Okay, exclusive. no pressure. All right, so first of all, Chanel, I haven't seen you in a long time. It's been forever. We we see each other and then we go out That's to the true. crowd and it it was a little overwhelming. Today we both talked about the fact that we haven't been out on a plaza where I looked up and Jenna was holding somebody's <laughs> cell phone taking a selfie and I almost felt awkward. I thought, okay, post COVID, I guess. Can you do that? Everybody's vaccinated. And then this lady said, Chanel, I watch every morning. High five. And I was like, can I high five? Okay. It was probably like slow mo. And then after I gave her a high five, I was like, oh wow. I haven't done that. In I know. A while. Well, you sent me pictures, or Zach sent us pictures, both of us, and there's all of these pictures of me hugging people, and yeah. I'm like, I guess we, so. Do we? Do we not? I and know. it's so funny because it's what everybody's going through. Well, we're outside. We're all vaccinated. I thought, you know what? In that moment, like I was looking, you know, making eye contact with people. They're so thankful to be out and on the plaza from Oklahoma, Texas. Vegas, Texas. I to, mean, everywhere. To also to be able to celebrate the Olympics, which is this th time when our whole sure. world comes together. Sure. Like the coming together of things is just so yeah. awesome. So we're out on the plaza with it, and I thought in that moment, okay, fine, Jenna, selfie, I'll high five. Yeah, let's just get That's in. What let's we just did. get in. Okay, yeah. we also had a really interesting conversation on the show about kids and mm -hmm. sports, which. You have some crazy I know. athletes. It resonated with me because both of my boys are hardcore soccer players, soccer fans, soccer players. Um, one of the guys, Adam Grant, made the comment that um, it's important that the kids still have fun. And yes. you know that. And as a parent, you know that. But that coaches also have to make it fun. I've gone to games where it seems like we'll look at the other team and the coach is like screaming at them. And I'll look at the other parents and I'll be like, I don't care. I hope we win because I want to show that coach. Yeah, this is not that's how you, not the way you right. act. So I'm hoping that, you know, what, what he said resonated, that you still want the kids at the end of the day to enjoy. Well, having fun is the doing. most important thing. And, yeah. and Abby once came on our show and Hoda and I wrote it down, Abby Wabak, because mm -hmm. she said, she said, you always ask the kids three questions. 
Did you have fun? Mm -hmm. Did you learn something? Mm -hmm. And of course, the third question is just escaping me, but it was something in that same line of right. like, was it enjoyable? Yeah. And it's so funny because I don't know if your childhood was like this, but, and and we, I sort of grew Well, up, I'm not athletic. No, well, me neither. Oh. As <laughs> the people that watch the show know very well, but I wasn't athletic, but anything, like my parents yeah. just did not push. Yeah. They, and, and I'm, and it's interesting now, like I kind of can't believe it because I would just do, I just signed up for all my classes mm -hmm. and would stay up late studying. But you know what I've noticed is that they had you busy. You yeah. were extracurricular activities. You know, you may have yeah. been on the stage, may not have been the best kid on the stage, but you were on the stage. Well, that's so true. I think hey, my excuse was always, me, I wasn't the best kid on the no, stage? No, I'm saying you may not have been, but it didn't matter. I think I was the oh, best <laughs> kid on the stage. I was not. I'm just kidding. You know, I, was I wasn't. Like, definitely but, not. But yeah, I mean, it's a matter of, and it's this funny line because it I is. think our generation of mothers mm -hmm. or parenting, there is more of this like pressure, pressure. cooker. Yeah. We didn't really, I didn't feel that. Did you? Yeah, no. It, well, I also think sometimes I look back, my mom was like, oh, do whatever you want yes. or whatever. It was my grandmother who was kind of like, okay, now let me see those grades. But it was never, it was almost like, I will say, I was rewarded for the good stuff, not punished for things that may not have been so great, yeah. right? So it was just a different way of shifting your mindset. So there was no fear. It was just excited about getting a quarter for each A yes. or, ooh, my grandmother's going to put a bumper sticker on the back of her car that says, I have an honor roll student. So it was positive spinning. Oh, somebody's that phone sense. is ringing rope. Is that, Hello? Does that mean it's a time I think that's a timer that says that's it for this episode Wait, of Today this Talks. So great. I, can we do this again? <laughs> We're going to do it Every day, do this we do this? Every day this week. Every day this week, you're going to get day. an episode of Today Talk Talks. Keep watching for more today, all day. Okay, so back to what we were saying. Yeah, let's keep okay, going. So let's blah, keep blah, 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 blah. <laughs> John, I mean, let's let's start with the present here. John, you you are the father of a U.S. Olympian. How does that how does that feel as a dad? It feels great. Um, I start thinking that in you know uh, that she actually is an Olympian. So yeah, it, it feels really good. I mean, obviously you're not there uh, because of because of COVID. I assume you've been in contact with her. How's she doing? Um, she's been doing pretty well. We we haven't talked to her uh, uh, personally because of the, of the time difference, but we have been texting her back and forth. And uh, yeah, she's they they just recently moved her to the Olympic Villa, so uh, we only talked to her through text. I know you're familiar with um, the positive test on the team. Um, there are lots of worries among athletes and their parents uh, and the Olympic officials about COVID. Are, are you worried at all? Yes, we, and we actually, I actually got a lot of texts when they, uh, somebody found out that there was somebody on the team was positive, but um, when we found out there was uh, an alternate, we weren't too worried, but still, yeah, we are worried. My wife especially, she's really worried. Is Sunni vaccinated? Yes. We're, uh, uh, the whole family's vaccinated except for the little one. And uh, Sunisa's vaccinated. She, uh, I know that before she left, she had to do like COVID tests every other day. So I'm, I'm pretty sure she's okay right now, but never know. Before she left for the games, what, what did you tell her? What kind of advice did you give her? Well, I, I told her that um, now, you know, her dream that making the Olympic was hard, but now she is actually in the Olympics. So, you know, she needs to go compete for her herself. You know, she's already made, uh, she's already proved to the, the community, her family, her friends, and her coach that she is capable of getting there. So now it's time for her to go and 
and uh, do it for herself. John, how did Suni discover gymnastics? Well, when Suni was a little kid, she, um, she's really hyper. She jumps around all the time. She uh, was able to do like the bridge and she you know, just liked to uh, jump around doing backflip and stuff like that. So we brought her into the gym because one of um, my wife's friend is the co uh, coach at Midwest. And we brought it in just for like a little trial. And they uh, thought that she was good enough to be on a team. So they put her on a team and that first year, and then, uh, then she trained over the summer and competed level four the, the following year. And she won state, so. How old was she then? She, we brought in at six, at level, uh, at age six. And then uh, she started competing at age seven. When did you realize she was a special gymnast? Well, after the first, you know, the, the first year when she competed, she won state. And then the second year, they, they jumped her three levels. And then after that, they put her on this, the HOPES program, which is the beginning of the elite level. And that's when I thought that, okay, well, she might have potential to be in the Olympics. So, you know, we just continue pushing her, helping her, supporting her. Were you gymnastically inclined? I don't even think that's a word, but, <laughs> but we'll pretend it is. Well, um, my wife, she, she plays sports when she was younger. I play a lot of sports. I'm very competitive when it comes to sports. And uh, I do do a lot of... Uh, backflips and stuff like that. I, when I was younger, I used to do flips off the wall, off the ceiling, things like that. But I think, I think her gymnastic uh, skills, I think that's from my wife's side, but, she, but the competitive uh, side is probably from me. I understand that when she was sort of starting out, that her dad was so committed to her success that he actually built a beam in the backyard. Is that true? Yes, it is, and it's still here. Remember that beam I built for you? Yes. Why'd you do that? Uh, well, the thing is, you know, she don't have a beam. You know, she goes to the gym and she practices, but we don't have a beam here, so. Go! I couldn't afford a real beam, so I built one out of, you know, a four by four six feet long and covered it with the uh, air mattress, you know, wrap. Why have you kept it all these years? I don't know. It just, uh, you know, she don't use it anymore, but it just sitting in the backyard and then just never, I never, never threw it away. I understand that, um, that Suni is, is making history in Tokyo. She is the first Mong, U.S. Olympian? How, how proud does that make you? Yeah, she, she will be the first Hmong American to, to be in the Olympic. So, yeah, I am proud. The family is proud. All the community is very proud of her. So, I don't know. We, it, you know, it's almost like it's unreal, you know, because... Yeah, especially in gymnastics where, you know, you got the whole country going for this uh, a spot on the team and, you know, there's only four spots available. So if she made it and that's pretty tough and it makes us proud. I'm very proud of her. How are you going to watch the games since you can't be there in person? What are, what are you going to do? We are planning to have a watch party at my brother's house. Um, they volunteered the house for us to watch. We actually, want, at first we wanted to do a, like a community watch party, but since the time difference and you know, all the games are gonna be really early in the morning, I don't think that's possible. So we are gonna go to my brother's house and watch the game with, with the family. John, do, do you still get nervous? Do you get nervous watching SUNY even after all these years? Yes. I do get nervous, but I don't show it. Um, I know my wife 
gets nervous and I, I could see that and I try not to show it, but I do. In, deep inside me, I do get a little nervous, especially when she does the beam, because that's, that's uh, you know, that platform is very narrow and it's, uh, it, it's high, so I do get a little nervous. But she's been doing it for so many years now. I mean, how, how can you still get nervous? Everybody gets nervous when a kid gets up, up, up on, the, on those uh, events. Especially you, you want to make her, you want to see her do well. You don't want her to make any mistakes. And then, of course, you, you get a little nervous. Double four. But once they're done, then you, you get relieved. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Oh, right. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Your daughter has called you her, her biggest cheerleader. I have read and heard uh, that she draws inspiration from dad. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, her journey to the Olympic, I was always with her most of the time because of my other kids at home. So my wife had to stay home with her. So I m m traveled with her to all her meets, all her competitions, and you know, we joke around a lot. And every time she go compete, I always tell, I always talk to her and say, hey, you know. Don't worry about it, you know, or just have fun, things like that. Because she's always getting nervous, and she always tells me that, ooh, this girl is so good, she's so, she don't think that she's going to do better than her. But I always have to tell her that it's okay. You, always, you, all, you will do better, and then, you know, when she comes out on top, you know, she's happy, so. How do you think that your accident inspires her? Um, when I got hurt, I didn't think that she would actually, um, she wasn't gonna go because she and her coach came to the hospital, met me, and uh, when I told him to just go ahead, go because she worked so hard for her, so when she left, I didn't expect her to, uh, feel that she had to do it for me, but then she did, and she said, she, 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 uh, she know that my accident, my, mm, my accident is worse than her uh, winning or losing a, on a team, so she did it for me, that's what she said. And I think that, and since then, she has continued to want to do it for me, so I'm proud of that. I'm happy that she competed for me. Let's talk about the accident for just a moment, John. Um, can you take me back to that day? What happened? Well, uh, it was a Sunday, and um, uh, me and a bunch of my friends, we just got done playing golf. And we went to a friend's house to, uh, to help him trim a tree down so then uh, he could set up a tent for his daughter's wedding. 
the following week. And, you know, because it was a simple trim, I didn't expect to, you know, I didn't, I wasn't, I was careless pretty much. I, we, I was up in a tree, trimmed the tree, and when it broke, it, it whiplashed and hit me, and I fell off the ladder and head first, so that, um, that caused, that, and then I went to the hospital and got, got, that's how I got hurt. What's been the hardest part of, of the, of the injury? The hardest part about the injury is that, you know, because of it's a spinal injury, you know, the hardest part is that I, I can't utilize my, anything beyond below my chest. Um, it, I'm paralyzed from chest down. So, um, that and also the fact that I'm always so outgoing. I'm, I've been, you know, I fixed a lot of things around the house and thing, cars, things like that. So, things that I can't do, I know how to do it, but I can't do physically. That is the hardest part, and I get frustrated sometimes. But, you know, I gotta learn how to cope with all that. How's the rehab going? Rehab's been um, going pretty good. My my upper body, I could do a lot of stuff with it. You know, my hands are getting stronger. Um, my balance is not so great, but I, I'm learning how to cope with that. Um, I volunteer for a program called E-Stand, where they inserted a, st uh, a stimulator in my back, and when I turn the, the the machine on, I could actually move my legs a little bit. Wow. D do you think that, that you'll walk again? I don't know. With the technology that we have right now, I hope so. If not, Anything, if I could stand up or just move a few feet, I would be happy. But um, I'm hoping that um, with the e-stand and also, you know, the, with all the technology, maybe someday I will be able to walk. That's my hope. So you'll, you'll watch your daughter compete at the Olympics in Tokyo. And as you're watching her, what will you be thinking? As I watch her, I'll be thinking if she bring home a couple of medals, hopefully a couple of gold, I mean, that would be so great for the family, the community, and for the USA. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think this, she'll compete again after this, or do you think this will be her first and her last? Well, I talked to her before she left, and... She really want to do college gymnastics, so I'm hoping that she, you know, after the Olympic, you know, she only got three more years before the next Olympic. I was hoping that she continue on, but but as far as I know, she wants to do college gymnastics. She want to go to college and compete. So it's up to her. You're you're not going to be there because of the virus. Um... I assure you, your daughter is going to watch this interview on the Today Show. What do you want to say to her? What do you want her to know? Well, one thing for sure, I, I want Tanisa to know that I'm proud of her no matter what happened. Um, I'm behind her, her, her family's behind her, the community's behind her, her fans behind her, and the United States behind her. So whatever she does, we are all proud of her. Just go out there, have fun. John, what's the secret? How do, how, do you, how do you rear a daughter to become a U.S. Olympian? I don't think there's really a secret. I mean, I talk to her, I motivate her, and I, I, I tell her to do good and just, just follow her heart, have fun. But the real secret is, I think it's her. I think she's pretty natural so in, in this uh, sport, so. It's all her. Most of it is her. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? 
Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Somebody said to me, check out TikTok. I'm like, I am 44 years old. I am not going to roll up on TikTok to mess with these kids. All right, so what was everybody's favorite and least favorite part of the day? Meet Jose Rolone, a Brooklyn-based wedding planner and single dad of three who goes by the username NYC Gay Dad in viral videos on TikTok and Instagram. You're making me clean again? <sighs> Don't make me destroy you. Parenting three kids during the pandemic gave him the creative spark that pushed him to the platform. LGBTQ rights have been going on for quite some time. But I do think in the parenting space, we really sort of still are at the forefront of that. This was a platform to be able to highlight LGBTQ plus family here that is doing the same things that you do. Was there a conscious decision to, to try and use it to break down barriers and, and shatter myths and preconceived ideas about what fatherhood is? You know, I grew up with a father who was all about like machismo and, you know, you couldn't talk about your feelings. And so I think one of the things I wanted to highlight too on social media is as a man, you can be vulnerable. Growing up, Jose always dreamed of one day becoming the kind of dad that he wished he'd had. You had this killer smile, beautiful eyes. After marrying his husband, Tim Merrill in 2010, it seemed like he was one step closer to making that dream a reality. When and how did you decide that uh, you were ready to be parents? When Tim and I met, I think he revealed to me on the third date that he did not want to have children. And I was like, oh man, we're in trouble here, right? Because I knew that I always wanted to have kids. But something happened right after we got married and we were outside of a coffee shop. And he said to me, so I want you to know that I've been open to being open to having children. I lost it. Through surrogacy, the pair welcomed their son Avery into the world in March of 2013. Tim ended up being this really incredible father. So when we hit two months, he was walking out of the room and was holding Avery in his arms. And he's like, babe, I think we should have more children. I was like, what? And we went for it. The unexpected happened. Their surrogate became pregnant with twins. But 11 weeks into the pregnancy, while his husband Tim was on a trip in Pennsylvania, Jose got a phone call that would change everything. And I got a call uh, from the Pennsylvania uh, Police Department. I get on the phone and uh, the detective told me that he had passed away uh, the night before. Uh, and it was a heart attack uh, in his sleep. There was so much running through my head, just not only having in that moment dealing with the grieving and feeling numb, but my mind also went to we're 11 weeks pregnant. My son just lost his father. What if something were to happen to me? I didn't want to leave him alone in this world. So 
I made a decision in that moment to not only follow through the pregnancy, uh, but I actually announced that we were pregnant while giving my husband's eulogy at a church in front of three, 400 people. Here we are, seven years later. Now my son is eight, my girls will be seven next week. I mean, you ever take a step back and you look at your life and you think, sweet God, what am I doing? Three children, single dad. Yeah, look, this ride has been wild. And I think we all go through phases of grieving. Nothing is permanent. I'm aware that this can shift like that. So for me, it's really vital that I stay in this moment and I appreciate it and I'm grateful. And I keep moving forward with my kids in the best way that I can so that when those moments come where stuff goes down, hopefully I'll be ready. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Keep going, keep going. Block the shot. Years ago, I used to say, forget about the ponytail and look at them as wrestlers because there's gonna be a point where the ponytail is not gonna matter. And we're at that point. Team Alpha is an all-girls wrestling club started five seasons ago. We started out with approximately nine girls, since have grown to over 50. An alpha wolf doesn't necessarily have to be an alpha male, right? Female wolf can be the alpha, the leader of the pack. You know, we're not quite leaders just yet on the national scene, but we're getting there. Participation in girls wrestling has seen a 500% increase since 2001 and is currently sanctioned as a high school sport in 21 states. Team Alpha's home state of New York isn't yet one of these, so girls either wrestle on the boys' team or compete in clubs outside of school. I have uh, two daughters, Kendall, who is 13. She's been wrestling just over three years, and McKenna, who is 10, and she's been wrestling a little over five, and she was probably around two or three. And my wife and I noticed that the only time she ever sat still was when she was either watching wrestling on TV with me or at tournaments. After watching one of those wrestling tournaments as a four-year-old, McKenna told her dad something that would change everything. And I was like, Dad, I want to start wrestling. And then I started wrestling on the boys' team at first, and then Dad made a girls' team. What do you like about wrestling? Since I'm wrestling, I feel like I'm tougher. When you were wrestling with the boys, did you enjoy that? Yeah, it's fun. When you wrestle them, it's not that intense as it is wrestling a girl. Why is that? Because boys um, aren't that tough. I'd probably do better if I wrestled boys, but I kind of like wrestling girls better, because, girls better because girls don't sweat as much as the boys do when we're wrestling. As a boy, I'll pretend not to be offended. Okay. The girls of Team Alpha range in age from kindergarten to 12th grade, but they all see themselves as part of the same movement. I feel like it's like partially like a women's rights movement in a way, because we're trying to get like a male dominant sport to also be like our sport. I've had coaches say girls shouldn't be wrestling, like just, you know, we all hear it, but I kind of block it out or just take it as like motivation to just push myself. Some of the kids in my class, I'm like, call me a tomboy. 
but I'd rather be a tomboy than a girly girl, so I like it better than that. I know it's 2020, but you know that there are still some people who think girls shouldn't be wrestling. Yeah. It's, it's not a sport for girls. What, what would you say to them? Um, I would say girls can do anything boys can. We just brush it off until they sanction girls wrestling here in New York, then we'll do what we gotta do to get the girls on the mat that wanna be on the mat. Coach Ken started wrestling in third grade, encouraged by his dad, a former high school wrestler who would work double shifts to support their family. Long days on the job prevented him from attending Ken's wrestling matches. You know, I ran around most of my teens, you know, mad, angry. Why doesn't my dad get to come to all my stuff like some of the other kids? When I started coaching my kids, and when they started to get older, I swore I'd never miss anything. So that's what I base everything around. I have to be there. 12, 13, 14. Ready? When I'm on the mat and I hear my dad on the side, I know that he loves me and he wants to get me like more into the sport. It's the best feeling a kid could ever have. He says, be a leader, not a follower. And I always listen to that. The first step's always the hardest in this sport. Once you take that first step, at the very least, you're gonna learn a work ethic that sticks with you forever. There's nothing wrong with being tough. You know, there's nothing wrong with being gritty. That's what gets it done on the mat. That's what gets it done in life. Before the girls came along, is, is this where you thought you'd be? Never. It's pretty cool though. It's, it's awesome. You know, I got two blood daughters and 50 more in the club. Alpha! We are! Alpha! Four, five, six! Family! up some exciting things this week in the brand new Today All Day Kitchen. Up next on Hashtag Cooking, Sama Dada <laughs> will show you how to rescue any brown spotty bananas with two tasty treats, chocolate chip banana bread bars and a banana cream cheesecake that just happens to be dairy free. Welcome to Hashtag Cooking. The next time you see some nearly perished, super ripe banana sitting on your counter, wondering what will become of their existence, like will we get thrown away today? Don't toss them, please save them. Rescue the spotty bananas, hashtag save the spotty bananas, and make these recipes. I'm gonna show you two of my favorite ways to use those super ripe bananas sitting on your counter. My chocolate, chocolate chip banana bread bars, and my banana cream cheesecake that happens to be dairy free. Let's get Hashtag Cooking. Just for one second, okay, I want you to forget about those microwave packets of oatmeal. And we're gonna give oatmeal a glamorous moment with these chocolate chip banana bread bars. I've already preheated my oven to 375 degrees, and now all I'm going to do is prepare my pan. So what I've done here, greased it with some coconut oil so our parchment paper doesn't stick, right? So I've got that here. I'm just gonna stick it right into the pan. The coconut oil helps it stick, right? So this is nice. Make sure we're hitting all of the edges of the pan. And what's nice is that we're creating these flaps, okay? The flaps are really nice because when it's done baking, we'll be able to easily lift the batter out of the pan and have our bars all ready. What's great about using super ripe bananas in recipes is that they're naturally a lot sweeter and a lot easier to mash into different recipes. Got two here. We're rescuing them. We're giving them a second life, a second chance at life. They love us for this. Throwing the peels away. I'm gonna peel this one like so, pop that in, see you later. Okay, and now we're just gonna mash. This is kind of where you can get your aggression of the day out <laughs> into these bananas, okay? 
I want to mash them until they're really nice and smooth. And like I said, because they're a bit riper, it's going to be a lot softer and easier to mash. Not to mention it's going to impart a lot of that really nice, sweet, ripe flavor of the bananas into this oatmeal bar recipe. And because they're super ripe, we're actually not going to use a bunch of sugar to sweeten this recipe because it's going to pull a lot of that natural sweetness from the bananas. Have I convinced you to not throw your bananas away yet? Just wondering. Okay. Really take your time here. <laughs> like I am. Okay. I want no banana to feel unmashed. I want it to feel all loved and mashed. <laughs> okay. All right. And you can use a potato masher here if you have that, if you like that utensil for your life. I'm just using a fork because you know what? Forks are accessible. Okay. So this is looking pretty good. I have to compliment myself on my mashing abilities. Looks pretty smooth. And now we're just gonna work on the rest of our ingredients. All right. So, in this recipe, I'm using two eggs, so I'm gonna crack those both in here. I wanna be that type of person that does like the one-handed egg crack. I'm not, I'm not that person. I'm safe, <laughs> I take precautions. <laughs> All right, okay, now I'm gonna whisk the eggs and the bananas together. So everything is nice and smooth. Look at those amber yolks. It's pretty nice. Bananas and eggs whisk together. They look nice and smooth, really happy in there. Now I'm gonna add my nut butter. So I'm actually using peanut butter here, but if you have a cashew butter at home, if you have an almond butter, that's totally fine. You do you. Whatever nut butter is you're harboring in your pantry. I know I have like a million because I have a problem, uh, but you can use that. I'm gonna slide that straight in there. Now I'm gonna mix that in. And then I'm gonna add my melted and cooled coconut oil, my vanilla extract, and if you haven't noticed already, the best part about this recipe, other than giving your sad bananas a second life, is the fact that we're making everything in one bowl. Like, you can thank me later for the less dishes that you'll have to do in your life, okay? I'm just using a touch of coconut sugar, gonna add that in there, and then some maple syrup gonna really give this nice, warm, golden flavor to these oatmeal bars. Now that I've mixed all my wet ingredients together, I'm gonna grab my oatmeal, the star of the show. It's about to be super glamorous. Add it straight in here. Along with some cinnamon. I love cinnamon, I think it's amazing, but you can totally use another spice if you want. You can use maybe a nutmeg if you like that better. I'll leave that choice up to you. And then some baking powder. And then, and mix everything together. Make sure everyone just becomes friends in here. Make sure we grab the edges, the sides of the bowl. Incorporate it really nicely. It smells so good. Mmm. Just wait till it's done baking though. That's good stuff. Okay. Now finally, this is a bit of the dessert for breakfast moment that I like to really capture in all aspects of my life. The chocolate chips. Just gonna fold these in. I will add, I don't measure these with anything but my soul. That's just how I choose to live my life, but again, you live yours the way you wanna live yours. I'm gonna fold that in, and you're probably wondering, like, Sama, why do you have some of these left over? Because I wanna save some for the top. Because for me, it's not less is more. When it comes to chocolate, not a thing for me. Okay, folding this in nicely until all the chocolate chips are just really nestled in there. <laughs> we want them to be cozy. Okay, perfect. Now, I love myself for being prepared. We've got our parchment lined pan, and I'm just gonna add it straight into there. So, flip this up. I don't know if I mentioned this, but this is my workout for the day, this movement right here. All right, so 
So we're gonna add this straight in there. Get everything out. Scrape the sides. Oh my god, I cannot leave that chocolate chip behind. That would be so sad. Okay. And then I'm just gonna spread it out throughout the pan so it's nice and evenly distributed. <laughs> okay, because I am me, I'm gonna add some more chocolate chips on top, just for aesthetics. I like to take nice photos of my food. It's also really fun to make it presentable and looks pretty, too pretty to eat, but not really, because we will be eating it, okay? And then the last, the last thing that I wanna do is add a banana on top. This is, again, purely for <laughs> me to have some nice aesthetics for my photographs. And that's fine. That's again, how I choose to live my life. So what I'm gonna do is just cut it right at the tip of the banana, slice it straight through like this, okay? And now I'm just gonna peel this off like I normally would. And then you've got two perfect halves of banana. Pretty easy. I'm gonna lift this straight out and I'm gonna place it on to my bars. Like that. And then the other half. And then I'm gonna add one more for the middle. Go ahead. And again, I have a piece of oatmeal on my finger. <laughs> really didn't want to be baked. Okay. And go from the top. Slice it straight down the middle. Guy off. Look at that. Add that straight. And there we're gonna nestle it down nicely. Wants to feel secure, wants to feel at home. And now I'm just gonna add a little dusting of cinnamon on top. Partially because I love cinnamon and partially because I want it to look really nice. Okay, now we're gonna take a little journey in the oven for about 22 to 25 minutes. Let's go. All right, hope you enjoy your time in there. has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. From New Orleans, there is breaking news. All right, we've let it cool for about 10 minutes, and now, see, this is why we love being prepared with the parchment paper. We get to just lift this straight out of the pan and then there's no oatmeal bar that's been left behind. Like that. Okay, so the best thing about these bars, other than the fact that we're saving so many bananas lives, is that they're super portable. So I'm just gonna slice them into little bars. You can take them on the go. You can just also have a nice sit down oatmeal moment at home. You choose whatever you'd like to do. I love the corner piece. I'm just one of those people. Don't know why. Just crispy and caramelized on the edges, it's so good. 
Look at that. Delicious. And now remember these chocolate chips that I had saved for the top? See, this is why. I'm also gonna add just a little bit of powdered sugar just to get that nice contrast. A little bit there. Just on the rest of my bars. It's really pretty. Oh, went a little heavy handed over there. Okay, so now I'm gonna take a few pictures of it because I didn't put that powdered sugar, that banana, those chocolate chips on for nothing. All right. There we go. <laughs> I'm really getting the shot. <laughs> Little video. Get the inside. Okay, you know what? I think we got the shot. It's my time to taste. I'm pretty excited about this. so good. You know what's really nice about this as well? It's not too sweet. So it's really great if you'd like to even add a little drizzle of honey on top, maybe a little more peanut butter, almond butter, whatever you have to kind of create this nice sit down oatmeal moment at home. It's like banana bread, but it's a little more textured from the oatmeal. And then you've got the chocolate chips that are totally giving it this like cookie dough vibe. I would eat cookie dough for breakfast. And I am kind of. Delish. You know, this has inspired me and I have a lot more ripe bananas in my kitchen, so I think we might have to make my banana cream cheesecake. I'm gonna go grab the ingredients. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Okay, do you want to know something crazy about this cheesecake? You don't have to bake it. No ovens are involved. We're just going to pop into the freezer to make it, which kind of means it's a cross between an ice cream bar and a cheesecake. Two things I really can't live my life without. So let's make it. The first thing I'm gonna do is prepare my pan with some parchment paper. So what I'm gonna do is just line it straight into the pan and I'm creating these flaps on the sides so that it's gonna be super easy to lift the cheesecake up after it's done freezing. Just like that. And now it's ready for our crust to find a home in it. So this crust is gonna be really nice and textured. It's gonna be a little crumbly, it's gonna be crispy. Because it's gonna have a really nice creamy filling to go on top of it, I wanted to create that contrast. Everything is gonna to come together in this food processor. 
starting with some raw almonds as the base. This is gonna give that really nice crispy crunchy element to the crust. Gonna toss that in there. And now to sweeten the crust up, we're gonna use some dates. I love dates, not the romantic kind, the medjool kind, okay? So we're gonna add these in. This gives a really nice caramel sweetness to the crust, and also it's gonna allow it to be a little bit sticky and pliable so we can actually just stick it straight into our pan. And now we're gonna add a little bit of creamy almond butter. That's straight inside. You can also use the peanut butter if that's what you have on hand, totally fine with me. I won't judge you. A bit of melted and cooled coconut oil going in there as well. A touch of vanilla extract. And then, I like to use a little pinch of salt. This is gonna bring out that natural sweetness and create a bit of a contrast. Perfect. I'm just gonna scrape down the sides just to make sure nobody is caught, nobody is left behind, and process it again. We're looking good. We want it to be crumbly, but there's also gonna be some of those pieces that remain. Now it's time to just pack it into our pan. Okay. Oh no. This is precious crust, precious cargo. We can't waste any of it. Now all I'm gonna do is just press it into my pan. Like this. And you wanna make sure it's evenly distributed throughout the entire pan and you can kinda see that it's sticking together as I tend to pack it. This is gonna serve as a really nice home for our creamy, luscious cheesecake filling. It's gonna be really happy sitting on top of here. We don't want the edges of this pan to feel unloved. We want the crust to be in there too, so make sure you get those corners as well. Okay. I think this looks pretty good if I ask myself. We're done packing the crust into the pan and now I'm gonna go grab the ingredients for our filling. been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So, it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. The secret about this cheesecake filling is that it's actually made from cashews. They're super rich and buttery, so they're the perfect ingredient to make really creamy sauces and fillings like we're gonna do in this cheesecake. But to get it there, we need to first soak them. You always wanna make sure you're starting with raw cashews. These are completely raw and unsalted. And you can either soak them overnight if you have patience and time, or you can do what I did, flash soak them for one hour in hot water until they're nice and soft. You are not gonna believe how creamy this cheesecake filling is gonna be. We're starting with our raw and soaked cashews, going straight into our blender. 
right in there. We're following it up with some coconut milk. I'm using full fat coconut milk here. We're not messing around with the low fat kind. Perfect for a really rich and creamy cheesecake filling. And I think this is a really great time to mention that this is a non-dairy recipe. I don't know if you've noticed, but all of you non-dairy folks out there, rejoice because this is for you. Time for our banana, our star. We rescued it from its fate in the trash, perhaps. All right, pop that straight in there. Just breaking it up so it's a bit easier to blend. And now we're gonna go in with our maple syrup. The ripe banana is really nice because it's super sweet already, but the maple syrup is just gonna pull it all together. I really like using maple syrup here because it's a really nice, warm, and golden contrast to those rich and creamy cashews. In there, and then a little touch of vanilla extract. Perfect. All right, we're gonna add some melted and cooled coconut oil. Just a touch. Now we're gonna add some lemon juice. This is super important because you've got rich ingredients like the cashews and the full fat coconut milk. So we want the lemon juice to give it that zing and really balance out those rich ingredients. I'm using this to catch the seeds. At home, you can even just put your fingers underneath the lemon and then catch the seeds in your hands. Little DIY. And then to balance everything out, balance that sweetness, bring it out a little bit, I'm gonna add a little pinch of salt. Okay, now it's time to blend. 